Hey everybody, welcome to our first New Relic Fundamentals platform training. Hello, How are you, how's everybody doing? So, um, guys, uh, this is um, this is our our very first session out of what is going to be a six-part series. We are going to take you pretty much all the way through uh, the New Relic platform, right? We want to show you, you know, all the capabilities, and uh, we want to get you guys a little bit hands-on as well. So, we want to get you doing uh, some labs. Uh, we will try and make it a little bit more uh, lab intensive as the sessions go through. Obviously, in the very beginning, we need to talk about concepts, but uh, certainly as we progress and you guys understand the concepts, you're going to want to get hands on and be able to jump in and, and do things. So that's uh, that's the goal uh, of what we're uh, trying to achieve over the next couple of weeks. So uh, we're hoping this uh, isn't going to be too uh, intrusive to your to your uh, normal day to day. Uh, that's uh, we have got the format uh, this time around being uh, once a week. So we're once a week every Monday at this time. Uh, and we're going to run this for six weeks straight. So if you can um, try to set that time aside, like block it out now, okay? If you can block that time out in your calendar right now uh, and make sure you attend <clears throat> every session, uh, you will get maximum value from the class. And um, I will also have a chat with our marketing team to see if we can perhaps provide some uh, goodies to uh, to those that uh, attend every session, um, yeah, we we can uh, get some things sent out for uh, people that uh, come in on every session. Now, just before we get started, we want to do a little couple of intros and things. Let me just get my screen sharing going. All right, uh, hopefully you guys can see my screen there. And uh, what I'm gonna do as well, you probably, it's funny actually, I'm listed here twice. I'm listed as being, well, me, and then I'm also listed as New Relic University. So I'm just gonna change that because I'm actually, uh, you know, I'm logged in as New Relic University. Yeah but I'll put my name in front there as well, okay? So, <clears throat> welcome to the training session, guys. Uh, my name's Dan, uh, that's what I look like without a beard, uh, just in case you wanna know. Uh, that was me two years ago. Uh, that was uh, right at the start of my tenure at New Relic. <clears throat> so I think that was that was about a week before I started, so you see what New Relic's done to me. <laughs> uh, geez, the world was a different place two years ago, wasn't it? Ah. Uh, you know, I had a, um, uh, this this role was uh, uh, roughly 50% travel, right? So I was um, supposed to be traveling around the APJ region, uh, delivering training sessions, uh, and occasionally doing the odd virtual. Obviously, as you guys know, uh, we are now 100% virtual uh, and zero travel. So that was uh, quite a bit of an adjustment. But, um, <clears throat> A little bit about my background before my time at New Relic. Uh, I've been in IT for over 20 years now, and uh, I started as a system uh, system admin and system engineer and a, a network admin. So I, I was quite very uh, infrastructure um, focused. And uh, around 2007 uh, and 2008, uh, I started training. And uh, I've actually first started training Linux. Uh, it was a SUSE Linux back at the time. And um, then uh, I was a VMware trainer for, I want to say, eight years. Yep. I uh, trained VMware from 2008 to about 2015. Uh, trained Cisco as well. So again, it's all very heavy infrastructure stuff. Uh, and then uh, I did ServiceNow for uh, four years. All right, uh, and uh, that's then what got me onto the other side of things and I uh, came across to New Relic uh, two years ago and uh, it's been a uh, very enjoyable journey uh, while here. So we are going to spend six sessions talking all about observability 
and how New Relic can uh, dramatically improve your end-to-end -end observability. Now, uh, I'm going to also introduce my co-host Ganesh. Ganesh has very kindly volunteered his time to join me on this session so that we can have a bit of an interactive uh, engagement. And um, I unfortunately, I'm going to apologize. I'm sorry, Ganesh, I don't have uh, a slide for you. <laughs> I forgot to uh, I forgot to create one. I could have got you a little Slack picture like I did with mine and stick it up there, but yeah, I don't. But if you can, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick us over to the agenda so you're not looking at me anymore. And uh, if you can give everybody a little bit of an intro as to yourself, your role at New Relic and your background. I didn't even mention my role. Um, yeah, I'm the lead technical training specialist in APJ, right? Um, so yeah, I essentially conduct all the training sessions. But uh, over to you, Ganesh, say hello. Hello, everyone. Um, and Dana, it's glad actually you did not pick up my Slack picture because I look older in my Slack picture than now. <laughs> so I'm, I'm actually feeling glad you didn't, you didn't pick up that picture. Um, yeah, so uh, hello, everyone. It's uh, um, I'm super excited to be uh, part of this session. Um, so uh, my name is Ganesh, um, and I joined Neuralink about three months ago as a principal technical account manager. Um, I come from a DevOps and performance engineering background, um, and I was once a customer of Neuralink. Um, um, I was working for um, a fintech um, based out of Bangalore in India by the name of Zest Money. Um, it, was a, it was into consumer lending, so I was heading the DevOps and information security teams there. Um, I, I come from a performance engineering background, so I was I have about a decade's experience in performance testing, application performance management, and engineering. And I've worked with service-based companies like Wipro for about six years now, and um, Publicis Apian for another six years, uh, and then I moved to um, startup. And then, you know, I just got super excited when New Relic announced their uh, Indian expansion. Uh, and regarding New Relic experience, uh, yes, I've used the solution for about six, seven years in the past and uh, during my work at Wipro and Purpose Sapient. So, um, yeah, that's that's about me. Super excited to be part of this session. Over to you, Dan. Uh, yes, I'm very excited to have you here because, um, well, it means I'll... I think I'll go crazy at a slower rate, right? I always feel like I'm going crazy because I'm usually talking to myself. But uh, having you here makes me feel a lot less crazy because I'm I'm talking to you, which is really good. Plus, the fact that we can't really um, go to offices and things anymore as well, it makes it even that much more beneficial to have someone uh, in front of you that you can talk to. Uh, I hope uh, the format is going to work well for uh, for everybody on the uh, on the sessions. Uh, we have conducted this kind of um, format before, and the feedback was always very, very good. Uh, and it seems to be a bit more fun and a bit more engaging uh, when we have um, uh, when we have two people sort of uh, back and forth uh, on our um, on our presentation. Now, uh, you can see <clears throat> our agenda, okay? And um, yeah, funny enough, if you're uh, keen-eyed, you'd realise uh, this is just a three-day class, okay? Um, I don't want you guys thinking, oh, this is, you know, this is incredibly long training or anything. Yeah, I mean, it goes for six weeks, right? But it's just, that's this like we're taking little bites. That's all we're doing. So actually, it, it's a three day class. Uh, so if you go to other vendor trainings, it's very, very common that you'll find five day classes, four day classes. Uh, I've settled on three because three seems to be the right amount uh, for the material that we're covering. And uh, if we ever go back to doing face-to-face -face training, then yes, I will conduct this in three days. But for now, we've broken it up into morning and afternoon across those three days, which gives us our six sessions. The three hours is the maximum amount of time that I will keep you guys, right? So uh, Ganesh and I will jabber on, <laughs> uh, we'll show you stuff, he'll do demos, I'll do demos, uh, we'll talk about different things, you guys will do labs, uh, but we will not keep you beyond that three hour point. Okay, so occasionally we won't finish a topic, uh, and I know people always ask about the agenda, they say, oh, I want to know about this one thing, right, When which session is that thing going to happen? Can't tell you guys, can't tell you, sorry. 
because so we will cover all the content but it kind of uh is a little bit organic right i mean there's a benefit to it being live it's not prescribed it's not regimented where we're going to say okay at at uh 247 is when we start the topic on this thing no it's largely driven by you guys right and uh that's a good thing and i want that to be the case if you guys have questions please 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 put those questions in okay now <clears throat> we got a lot of people uh on the session and i'm hoping that we keep you guys for the entire uh the entire six weeks uh that being the case yeah your, your mics are off can you imagine if we have a hundred and something microphones all working at once it's going to be a disaster so please put your questions in the chat and either myself or Ganesh will uh, come up with an answer. And sometimes we, we won't type an answer. It might be that we see a question, we will read out that question. We will say, wow, what a wonderful question. Let's talk about that. And we might give you an explanation or uh, you know perhaps a demonstration on of whatever it is that you're asking for. So that takes us into different sections of the platform. Sometimes we'll talk about a topic that is maybe due for a different session but if you guys are all interested in in an earlier session we might cover it in the earlier session and not in the later one so we do try to always keep it fluid because it also makes it a lot more engaging for you guys <clears throat> now having said all that at a very high level quite loosely today is our overview day right it's our introduction we're going to go through what New Relic can do for you <clears throat> and what observability is all about and why you should care about observability. Like why it is that it's more critical now than it's ever been before. All right, so we're gonna talk all about that. Next week, I was about to say tomorrow. <clears throat> I sometimes run these classes consecutive. <laughs> Next week, <clears throat> we're gonna come back and we're going to focus a little bit more on the back end side of things, right? Remember, we're looking at full stack observability. Right, so if you are only interested in a little piece of it, right, then you're gonna miss out on the level of observability that you can get and you probably need. So yeah, next week we'll talk more detail on APM, logs, uh, a little bit on infrastructure as well. Uh, and then the third week we will go a little bit further into infrastructure and we will also cover alerting. In our fourth session, it's where we're going to go into dashboarding and we're going to go through Nurkle. So we will show you how to create NRQL queries so that you can get the most out of the data that is stored in our purpose-built telemetry database. Uh, and we will also show you that you can alert on any query that you can come up with, pretty much. All right? If your query returns a numerical value, you can alert on that. So we sometimes get the question, you know, what can I alert on? And it's like, well, you know, anything that you ask the system that you can return a numerical value on can be alerted on. Um, the more important question to ask is, why would you want to alert on that, right? You should really answer those questions before you say, well, yes, we can alert on everything. <clears throat> uh, I should change this slide. I typically do these in reverse. <laughs> um, I finish with synthetics. That tends to be our very, very last session. And our second last session uh, will be going through uh, front end, uh, real time user monitoring, right? So that's where we'll talk uh, a lot about browser, a little bit about mobile as well. So that is uh, roughly what we're going to be covering uh, over the um, over the six weeks. <clears throat> and um, yeah, uh, and, and I, I knew I was going to get this question. Right, I, I knew it, I knew it. How did I know it? Because I always get it, right? Um, so will the sessions be recorded and be made available to participants? You know, uh, I was gonna go on a date one time with this girl and um, what I decided to say to her instead is, hey, um, I know we've got, a, we, we've got a time set aside, you know, next, uh, you know, Friday night at 7 p.m., but can you just record it and so I can watch it later, right? Uh, yeah, I see it didn't go down too well. <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's just a joke, guys. It's a, it's a pretty bad joke. But <laughs> my, my point with the joke is that um, 
and and to actually answer your question yes there will be recordings provided to the attendees right um you know if you register and you don't attend the sessions you don't get a recording just like you know if you know, maybe if I go on the date and I actually film it, which would be creepy, but if I did, I'd have a recording. <laughs> right. Um, so the recordings are, uh, are provided, with, I, I will give them to you. Um, it's not really, I don't want you guys to think, oh, okay, I'll just do it later. It's really more for if you have a connectivity problem. Okay. So if we have some kind of an issue and you drop off and you, oh no, my session's gone and you have to come back in 20 minutes later and you know, your, your whole internet died or something. Yeah. I mean, it's cool. So, um, don't worry guys, there will be recordings, uh, that I will, um, that I will pass on to you guys. So, um, but just like if you were going on a date, I, I want you to treat it like that. Okay. Like be present, right? She, she's not going to be impressed if you just, <laughs> If you if you don't turn up and ask her to record it, or if you do turn up and you just don't pay attention, she's not going to like that either. <laughs> All right. Um, now slides. That's another question. Do we have slides? Um, do you know what? I've got a few, but they're all over the place, uh, and they're not they're not in a really good order. Most of what we're going to do is demo. So yeah, I'm not really going to do the slides. But the recordings you can get, okay? So you can play back these dumb jokes to your heart's content afterwards, okay? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so uh, let's um, uh, let's finish off this um, this intro deck. I'm not going to go through every single slide here, but um, hey, I just had it as, at a at a guess. <clears throat> How many of you have an environment that looks something like this? I bet you've seen environments that look like this, Ganesh. You know what? We can. I can still see your agenda screen. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. See my bad. Yeah. See, that's why I love having you here. See, you've proven yourself incredibly <laughs> useful right now. <laughs> All right. How about that? Is that good? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I can. I can see the um, the ways we monitor software needs to change. Yep. All right, and uh, guys, I definitely, I definitely have seen um, environments like this. That's where, um, you know, we have a lot of data to be collected from our systems, and um, because not everything can be brought by one tool or one solution, there are fairly good chances that you know a lot of our customers use multiple tools, multiple tools to fetch all of this data from different data points and then gather it in different places. Yeah, it looks very familiar. Do you think it's more the, is, this, is, this, is it the standard or is it the exception? <laughs> uh, depends on the use case. It's definitely not the standard, I would say. Uh, purely depends on the use case and the priorities um, in different places. Yeah, definitely not the standard. Well, well, it's it's uh, it's really good to see things changing, uh, and actually, this slide kind of uh, it kind of highlights the whole new relic business, right? It tells you what our what our objectives are as an organization. Our objective is to make this make sense. If your environment looks anything like this, and it's a bit messy in there, you just got things all over the place. We want it to start making sense to you. So, one of the ways that you're going to need to do this right from the very beginning is to develop <clears throat> a single source of truth for your telemetry data. All right. So, having all your data going to all different places is always going to keep things um, a little bit messy, right? And you're never going to get the level of visibility that you're going to want and in the future you're going to need. So <clears throat> um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but this is really what our what our focus is, is to tidy up this slide and to make it so that the telemetry that you can get from all different sources all comes to one place, which can then be uh, correlated together and you can make a lot more sense of it uh, and be able to make better, more intelligent decisions in the long run, right? So yeah, it's um, you know it's time for us to have a new approach. The data siloed approach, where everything is you know all separated out, is not uh, you know is not working for us any longer. 
okay? So we need to start being much more proactive about our environment. And uh, the only thing I really wanna point out here on this slide is the very last point, right? Over on the right, where we say, we want to instrument everything. <clears throat> okay, so um, it should no longer really be a case of, you know, why would I instrument? But maybe you should just, you know, turn the question around altogether and say, why would you not instrument that, All right? Um, if you guys wanna ask me that question, say, Dan, what is it that we should be instrumenting? Um, you know, my answer is, well, anything that you want visibility into, right? So are you, you know, if you're developing an app or you're managing a service or something like that, do you wanna see how it's performing, right? Well, then yeah, you instrument it, right? So um, I kind of want you to like, think about it a little bit like driving a vehicle, right? In, in software, it is, it is very much like that, right? And if you keep this in mind, the whole, the need for observability makes perfect sense, right? If you're driving a car or, you know, if we go back even before cars and you've got something like a horse and cart, right? And this thing goes pretty slowly, right? Um, it, you know, it makes sense that you might think there probably isn't any requirement for a speedo on a horse and cart, right? You don't need a speedometer because you're just not going that fast, right? And aside from that, the horse can take care of it, right? But when you move from that vehicle to a much faster vehicle, like a car, all of a sudden this thing that was kind of, it would have been a trivial thing, oh, yeah, I can have a speedometer or not on the horse car, it doesn't make a difference. But in a car, it becomes essential, right? And this rule applies for all vehicles, right? It makes perfect sense that, you know, when you move from a car to an aircraft, which goes much faster again, you have much, much, much more instrumentation. And then you go from an aircraft to a rocket and you've got way more instrumentation again. So how much instrumentation you have ultimately comes down to how much observability you need. How much observability you need ultimately comes down to how fast you wanna go. So the question should be not, should I instrument this or not? But the question is, well, how fast do you guys want to go in your business, right? How fast do you want to be releasing your product? You know, how fast do you want to be fixing things? How fast do you want to be responding to stuff? The faster you want to go, the more observability you need. The more observability you need, the more you'll need to instrument to get that level of observability. And that's the crux of this whole course, right? If you can just take that thing away, that's pretty much the most important thing. The rest of the whole class, we're gonna be talking about how to do all this stuff. But the why is also very, very important, which is why we cover it straight away. Any thoughts on that, Ganesh? Yes, um, so can I say that the faster we want to grow, the complex, the more complex the systems will become. And mm -hmm. now that the systems are going to be complex, you really want to get insights into every single aspect of your system. And that's where instrumenting everything comes into picture because in few of my demos, I use an example where I show, you know, um, probably the uh, the very first satellite that got launched somewhere in 1920s and then mm -hmm. the Tesla car that we have today. You have a lot of systems in there and unless and until your, you have insights into every single component of your Tesla car, you really can't make sure that it runs well. Right. So yeah, yeah. the fast the, the faster you want to grow, the more complex your system is going to get. And that's where you need insights into every single component of your system. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. And when you're talking about Tesla cars or any car for that matter, you know, you you won't see a manufacturer out there that produces a product without instrumentation. And then you have to take that product afterwards and put the instrumentation in. Can you imagine? Imagine you buy a car and then you have to go to another uh, another company that is going to, you know, put all the sensors in the car and then give you a dashboard and do all that. It's impossible. In the same way in software, right, when we are developing our software, you need to embed the instrumentation all the way through. So it's not a, 
I write my software and then afterwards I instrument it, it's no, it's all part of the writing. So it's all one and the same. And it's not an optional thing anymore if we want to start moving faster in you know, the modern yeah. world. So let's talk a little bit about the New Relic platform and uh, you know New Relic 1, what it actually is. So uh, you guys may or may not know, we kind of have a couple of layers to this thing. All right, so it is a full observability platform um, and it's uh, it's even programmable, guys. So if it, if it doesn't have a specific solution that you guys really want, uh, you can write an app that lives on the platform that that will um, uh, consume your telemetry data in a totally different way that we haven't envisaged, right? So the idea is we've, we give you the platform, but you have control of, you know, where, where the data can come from, because it's open, right? We'll ingest data from anywhere. And then you've even got control of how that uh, telemetry data gets consumed on your side. Maybe there's, you're missing a specific functionality. So you, you write an app just for that, to um, to look at your data in a whole different way. So at the lowest level, uh, well, yeah, the base level is what we call TDP. You hear me talk about TDP. We're talking about our telemetry data platform, all right? Uh, that's where all the data goes, right? On top of TDP, we have full stack observability. Now these are the New Relic built applications that will, um, make sense, so out of the box, make sense of the telemetry data that you are ingesting via TDP. And then at the top layer, so you think about it, you're pushing data from all over the place into New Relic. It goes in via TDP. You can look at that data uh, from many, many different vantage points, right, using the different products that we have that sit on top of the platform. But if you've got data coming from all over the place, we are now able to start doing things like uh, correlating things that may have come in at the same time from different sources. Uh, they might have some of the same data in some of the same fields. So what we can do is we can be a little bit more proactive as to how we respond to things. So, uh, you know, alerts are great, but Essentially, when you are creating alerts, you're you're creating uh, triggers that you're aware of. But sometimes things happen that you're not aware of at all, and it would appear in the system as an anomaly, right? So applied intelligence attempts to look at your data and be able to pick out things that don't look normal in your own data, and also correlate different sources uh, so that we can. Um, we can start reducing uh, some of the noise with regard to alerts as well. So going into each one of these a little bit more detail, <clears throat> uh, what do we have in TDP? Well, I mentioned it was an open data ingest. So um, you can pull data in from essentially any open source. Uh, alerting happens at the TDP level. Uh, you can do your own data analysis, so you can do querying, uh, you can create your own uh, dashboards, and uh, you can do log management, uh, even uh, integration with things like Grafana. And as you can see, there are there are over 300, I think it was like 360 or something last time. Um, we say plus 300 integrations, but really it's kind of infinity, <laughs> right? Um, and that's because we have this one integration, which kind of rules them all now, right? And um, so that's called Flex. I don't know if you guys have heard of that, but there's a thing called Flex. And um, essentially, if your external system, if, if, if you can get data from running a command or from reading a file or from, you know, making an API call, something like that, if, if you can get data from your from whatever integration it is that you're wanting to to uh, observe, if you can get it from there, then Flex can send that telemetry into New Relic. So that's kind of why we say just about anything could be instrumented. 
some things easier than others, but just about anything can be instrumented. So this will allow all your data from everywhere to come into New Relic. And as I mentioned, it's programmable. So if you want to write a whole new app to visualize your data in a new way, absolutely go ahead, have a lot of fun with it. Uh, if you are interested in that, I can just uh, uh, developer, I can show you this site here, which is where you would go. And you can see here, there is actually a, uh, there's a bit of an online tutorial here where you can come in and build apps, set up your development environment. And this is creating an app on the New Relic platform. All right, so you'll need, um, you'll need to know React JS right, in order to be able to, because the apps are written in React. Uh, but uh, yeah, we've got some, we've got some little tutorials for you to get started there if you are interested in the, in the programmability side uh, of the platform. All right. Um, it mentions here, you know, dashboards plus Grafana. So one of the points I might mention here is that, for example, if you if your organization has already gone to the trouble of setting up Grafana in some of your silos, you don't have to give that up. That's what we're saying here. What we're saying is you could send that telemetry data to New Relic and you can then have those Grafana dashboards using New Relic's NRDB as the source of that dashboard data. So now you're correlating all the data back into one source, but you're still using those tools that you've, or, that you've already invested time and effort in, uh, in building out. Um, because we're well aware that you know, your, your different teams are probably using different tools and some of your teams may have invested time and effort somewhere else already. We don't want that to be a hindrance to you guys uh, bringing all your data together. So uh, that's that's the important point there. Now, so that's that's our that's our telemetry data platform level. Uh, then when we move up to full stack observability, we're now looking at the products that New Relic have that will out of the box make sense of your ingested telemetry data, right? Because without full stack observability, you have all your telemetry data in New Relic, but it's up to you to make sense of it. So if you're wanting to look at your application performance monitoring, your underlying infrastructure, your customer experience, right? We have uh, we have a product that will look at the browser telemetry, the mobile telemetry. Uh, we have a synthetics product, which will, uh, it's essentially just a, a distributed testing platform that allows you to uh, perform a whole bunch of different front end functions, right? Uh, from many, many different locations around the world on a scheduled basis. So hugely advantageous there, uh, especially if you want to proactively capture problems before your customers do, uh, that can be very good. Uh, yet there's, uh, we now have a, a observability for uh, serverless uh, and um, we also have, uh, you know, at this layer, so you've got log management at the TDP layer which means we allow you to ingest your logs. But when you start using the New Relic uh, curated experience, we can now do pretty awesome stuff like, um, what's an example of it? All right, an example of it might be, you've instrumented a Kubernetes cluster, for example, and uh, you're looking at that in the main chart in your infrastructure. And we'll show you all this stuff a little bit later on, right? But just to give you an example, um, and you can pull up a pod, for example, and then click a little link that says, show me the logs, and it will filter to just the logs for that pod at that time. So it's no longer just a generic log ingest, which is, okay, cool, all logs go here and it's a big thing and now you've got to formulate these incredibly complex questions <laughs> on, on your logging data for it to make sense. No, uh, with full stack observability, out of the box on some of these, you know, key functions like, you know, uh, in a Kubernetes cluster, for example, 
show me just the logs related to that. All right. So yeah, we call it logs in context because they they are only the logs specific to the context of the thing that you're looking at. It's a little bit different to log management, which is just the wholesale ingestion of all your logs. So again, a bit of terminology here, just trying to set you guys up. <clears throat> Top layer. Yeah. Applied in. Yep. Ganesh, go for it. Yeah. So the logs in context, right? That's that that's a that's a very interesting one, um, especially for all the developers on the call today, because uh, I've seen instances where being part of the DevOps team, um, if we when we go and tell the developers that hey, you know what, there's an issue in production, and then we are seeing so many errors. The very first thing that the developers would, developers loves logs, they, right? They 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 love logs. Yep. So any developer who we go and tell him that hey, you know what, there's an issue on production, and we're seeing this specific error. The very first thing that they would do is you know what, let me go and look at the logs, and then the very first thing is they look at the logs, and then they say. Hey, I'm seeing a failure, but then I really want to understand where the exact failure is. And then they would jump onto a different tool to see the APM trace and identify which part of the code is actually causing this failure. And now logs in context is, I would say, it's a gift to the developers that, uh, uh, and when they find an error, the best thing that they can do is just go, as per the just the the, the generic process that they follow, uh, then just go go into the logs, find the error, and mm -hmm. Connecting something from the APM side to the logs is, is a gift to the developers, right? And I've seen developers using the feature and then saying, this is amazing. I really don't have to jump between like three, four different screens. It's just few clicks and then I get the answer for my question. Yeah, so, and, it, and the answer will be in the exact context of whatever it is they're looking at. So if they're looking at a, a at a trace, for example, so they're, they're going through a transaction trace, so they're not in a Kubernetes cluster, they're not looking at their infrastructure, but yeah. they're trying to work out what's going on with this transaction, right? And they're looking at a trace and then they go click the logs. They can get the logs specifically related to that trace. That is true. Yeah, so it's, um, yeah, I, I totally agree. It's I think it's a it's a very, very cool product. Uh, now, uh, the top level that we mentioned uh, a moment ago was applied intelligence. All right, this one, as we say, look, it's we, we want to detect, uh, we want to understand and resolve things uh, before they become big things, right? Before they get noticed, right? So I mentioned already that it has what we call anomaly detection. So now that you're ingesting everything into New Relic, we can see your telemetry data coming in. We can see what seems normal and we can see when things don't appear normal. And we can we can bubble those up to the surface. We can highlight these things for you, all right? Um, we, um, we can reduce alert fatigue as well, as I mentioned, by having, uh, if you've got telemetry coming from multiple sources, we ingest all of that. Now, it's pretty typical that if you guys have uh, an outage, some kind of a failure, uh, it, it, it's very common these days that multiple systems will alert on that failure. But one of the problems we have is that, well, it's one failure, but now you've received multiple uh, issues that you have to investigate. So the idea behind this is to reduce the noise and enrich the messages that you do get. So rather than being alerted by five systems that something has crashed, you get one alert with the enrichment of all five systems. So you'll have one issue to deal with and it will have all the data from all the different systems that, that fired, notifying you that there was a problem. So now you're able to quite easily correlate, oh, okay, well, I, it, you know, my storage system says this, but my database says that, right? And it correlates it together as part of that one outage makes it a lot easier for you to see all the problems uh, in the one place. Um, yeah, and that should hopefully result in you guys determining your root cause much faster, right? Uh, you know what? I think we are done here. You know what I'm going to do now? Uh, I'm going to give you this. This is your login for the next couple of weeks, guys. So uh, we will give you access to a New Relic training account. This will 
allow you to go in and play around. Uh, there's a couple of accounts that, uh, there's a couple of new Relic accounts that this training account uh, has uh, has access on. Some of them are read only, uh, and some of them will actually let you, um, you know, let you make changes as well. But um, yeah, if you can, just uh, make a note of that now, right? If you can please uh, record those details. I mean, I, I do sort of mention them later and I put them in the chat, but in order to save me doing it six times, like once each session, <laughs> uh, if you guys can record it, that would be that would be really really good. And did you guys have any questions? And just on I that as well, I am seeing a couple of questions here on um, on the chat. Um, yep, just trying to answer them here. Um, I see that. Um, uh, we have a question that says there seems to be a lot of uh, there seems to be a bit of overlap between Neuralink and tools like Splunk and Sumo Logic. What are mm -hmm. the differences? Um, when and uh, when do you use one over the other? Does it really make sense for them to coexist? That was a great question, Jack. Um, when it, as as for the features, um, you know, tools like Sumo Logic and uh, Splunk and Neuralink collect different types of data from different and similar sources. However, the way Neuralink treats the data is 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 different compared to that of um, traditional log analysis tools like Splunk and Sumo Logic. Because I've used I've used all of these three tools, and the way Sumo Logic and Splunk treats the data is more from a log analysis perspective, but whereas from Neuralic, um, it's just not the data is collected and then treated as a traditional log analysis tool, but then the, the, the power of this comes from the correlation between how your application is performing to how your front end is performing to what are the logs that are generated. And everything comes in, the, comes in one context. That's exactly the logs in context that Dan and I was, um, I was chatting a bit, a bit ago, right? So, Connecting all the data from the front end to the back end to the logs and to the infrastructure is what Neuralink does. Whereas um, from traditional log analysis tools like Splunk and Sumo Logic, they treat logs like logs. There's a bit of APM, APM instrumentation data that Splunk and Sumo Logic are also getting in these days. But whereas Neuralink being a very mature tool that is in market from like one, one and a half decade in the past, we are APM intensive. And now, now that we are bringing in logs, we can give the complete connected data um, from all the components. Do you want to add anything there, Dan? I, know, I think I think you did pretty well. I think um, I, I think another way to answer the question, um, which is very similar to what you said, I think a lot of uh, th there is there is overlap, right? Um, and when you see how the industry has evolved, it makes kind of perfect sense that there's going to be overlap because when you look at what it takes to to gain full stack observability I mean we're just, we're throwing these term around right full stack observability full stack observability but what does it really mean right it means that you have instrumentation right at the front end right you know what your customer is doing and then you right. know what your app is doing and then you know what your infrastructure is doing and you also have all the logs for all that, right? So if that's what full stack observability is, it kind of makes sense that the way the industry would have evolved is that different organizations would have seen, oh, um, there's a market for this you know, for, for, for visibility here. And there's another market for visibility there. But what New Relic found was that there's a market to correlate it all together and to make sense of the whole lot, right? Um, if you guys, and I, I better put this out there right now, right? If you guys are thinking, uh, you know, full stack observability is from your app down to the infrastructure, I would say you're wrong. Right, that's half stack. It's like not even really a term, but it, I call it a half stack observability. <laughs> right. So 
I know why you might think it's full stack because you're saying, but Dan, this is all I can touch, all I can affect. It's my app on my infra, right? So I'm observing my stack. You can call it your stack. You can't call it full stack, right? <laughs> so you might have your stack observability, but what you really want is full stack observability, right? Now, so what I'm really talking about there is just bringing that front end in, you know, the often neglected front end. And I'll give you a perfect example of why you would want to do this, right? Let's say you've got an app with a 500 millisecond response time, yeah? And you guys have got a an agenda to improve the response time of that app and you work hard on it and you manage to get it from 500 milliseconds down to 400 milliseconds. And then all of a sudden the customer is more unhappy with you than they were before, right? You've, you've got a vis, a, 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 you've got a measurement, right? You can say, but we went from 500 to 400. Why is the customer unhappy with us? Right? So maybe you did a bit of code refactoring and you, you did a bit of fancy stuff and you shipped more of your code to the front end. Maybe you did that, right? Now the customer's browser has more work to do, but you're doing your stack observability, not full stack observability. So you didn't see that by having a, shaving 100 milliseconds off your app response time, you caused a one second increase in response time for the customer. That's the difference between your stack observability and full stack observability. Full stack allows you to see things how they are from the customer's point of view. And that's really how we should be looking at everything, right? We don't want to look right. at it from the point of view of, Oh, it, it, it's good for us, right? Like they don't, they don't build cars for professional race car drivers. I mean, well, yes, they do, but they don't build mainstream cars for that audience. They build mainstream cars with drivability in mind. You know, they want to make it smooth and enjoyable. And that's all the customer cares about. They just want things to seem nice and good, right? They don't care that your app went from 500 to 400 milliseconds. They just go, I click the thing and it doesn't work now. <laughs> I didn't even time it. It just it feels slow. I don't like it. <laughs> so that's what we're trying to pick up from a customer point of view. All right. So going back to your question, the overlap will be there because there are many vendors that provide one part of this overall observability. The challenge is bringing it all together. The challenge is the unification of the whole thing, all right? Okay. So uh, yeah, it's 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 it, they 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 will coexist. Um, from I can tell you from a new relic standpoint, you know it doesn't make sense for them to coexist. We expect uh, your organizations will probably have multiple different uh, observability tools in your environment, right? Um, our goal and our focus is to play nice. <laughs> right. If I have to summarize what New Relic does, we play nice with everybody, right? So we allow all telemetry, right? You can ingest from anywhere. We, we're not going to hold it against you if you're using vendor A or vendor B for whatever. But what we do want to say is if you want that full observability, you're going to need to start bringing it in for your own benefit, right? So yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and especially for, for, I think for, the next foreseeable future, uh, things will coexist for a very long time. I, I, I really like the words that you used, half stack observability and our stack observability. I think we should probably start using that internally as well. <laughs> well, um, you know, it's, yeah, it's just one of those things, isn't it? <laughs> so we have another question. Um, and uh, do we need to, uh, we, we got a lot of telemetry in influx. Um, can we ingest that? or uh, do we have to duplicate it in TDP? I think that's where we start talking about our open source instrumentation that we have. Um, so if we are, if you are already recording data, uh, telemetry data into Influx, I'm pretty sure it's either part of, from your Telegraph or it should be through your Prometheus. And we have integration with um, a bunch of open source uh, solutions, which we will talk about a little bit 
um, in the upcoming sessions. But yeah, it is possible. Um, you'll just have to send the data to Neuralink uh, NR1 platform as well for some time till you build all your dashboards and till you get enough information, till you get comfortable, and then you can just start sending data only to Neuralink 1 platform. Yeah, that's a good point. I think, um, especially if you're planning a transition, right? So if you're migrating where your telemetry data is, it would make sense for a period of time, you will want that data to go to both places. Right? You don't want to disrupt what you're currently seeing, but you do want to build out your full observability. So for a period of time at least, until you've got that telemetry data up and running on the other side, and you've got the level of history that you need, then you will want that to go to both places. Yep. Now the question, uh, when you collect data, can you collect from proprietary sources? Um, and if you are asking about, when you say proprietary sources, if you're asking about um, probably an on-premise server where you have your own software, and if you have, um you know any command line utilities that you can use to pull some stats that's exactly what dan was talking about some time back um it's a flex feature that we have as part of our uh, infrastructure agent all you have to do is configure this run the command line um, utility commands and export the data to new relic um yeah i think that will be that that will probably be one of the sessions that we'll talk yeah so I mean, yeah, yeah may, maybe you've got a, a proprietary in-house purpose-built database uh, that you guys are doing something with, right? Um, yeah, if you have commands that you could run at command line uh, that would allow you to gain information from that database that you guys built, or if you have uh, if you have files like log files, for example, uh, you know, if, 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 if you can gain data about that app, either from reading a file or from running a command or from calling an API, then you can use the new relic flex infrastructure integration to do it for you. So you can so flex will run the command or flex will read the file, right? And then it will send that into New Relic as telemetry data. So the question really becomes, you know, whatever that proprietary application is, do you have a means of obtaining uh, information from it as it stands? All right? Can you ask it about its performance and how how it's how it's doing what it's doing? And if you have the ability to do that, then Flex can ingest. So I mean, if you've got no permissions into it and it's this closed box system and, and you can only maybe run one or two commands and it's not going to give you the info that you want, then if you can't do it, then Flex can't do it. At, at, you know, at a yep. at a very high level, that's the way I'd explain it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, could we have custom data analysis algorithm applied? Um, I'm afraid that um, is not possible because um, NR1 platform comes with um, data analysis algorithms that are inbuilt. And those are all basically the homegrown algorithms that we have on how to treat the data and how to connect the data between different components. So yeah, I mean, data analysis algorithm is something that, that comes with the platform. It's, 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 not, it's, it's not something like you can add a little bit of salt in the dish that the chef just made it for you. But uh, yeah, so, uh, I'm afraid that would not be possible. Anything, anything um, on that, Dan? The only thing I'll add with that, just in terms of custom data analysis, right? Can you do something different to your data? In some hmm. ways you can, a little bit, right? So you can actually apply rules that uh, alter the ingest, right? So you can say, you know, I dropped this data, we don't want to take that in, right? Um, so you can do that kind of thing. Um, and so that, that sort of analyzes the ingest data as it's coming in for the purpose of, you know, filtering, right? So you can do that. Uh, the other thing that you can do is you can actually create your own, um, you can create your own rules in applied intelligence as well, where you can affect the decisions. So that again, comes into data analysis to a degree and it allows you to customize 
uh, what it's doing. So it'll have a couple of things that it does out of the box, but then you can say, for example, oh, hey, I've got these two sources and I've configured them when they send data in, it will look like this. And if it looks like this, then correlate those events. Um, so depending on what type of analysis you want to do, uh, different parts of the platform do have different ways of customizing how they handle your data. All right, so I hope that answers it in a little bit more detail as well. Yep. Cool. Um, so yeah, um, ELK plus machine learning algorithm is that is that actually full stack up full observability? It's like a loaded question. Do you want to take it, Kanesh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. So ELK is 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 the solution that you're using to collect data, and ML algorithm is the way that you are defining how the data should be treated. It really depends on what data you're collecting on ELK. That's that that that's more that's more important. So ELK and ML is 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 I would say the um, the solution that you is is the one which is collecting the data. But what data are you collecting is more important. I know you're manufacturing something, but you should tell what you're trying to manufacture. Is it a car? Is it a bike? Or is it what? What is it? Right. That's what makes it more. Um, that, that that's what uh, defines what full stack observability is. If you're using ELK and you're using a brilliant machine learning algorithm and just collecting your logs, no, it's not. It's not full stack observability. And in Dan's words, it's half stack observability. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, can, can I also say, guys, just in it, with regard to machine learning and applied intelligence, right? Because everybody, everybody wants that, right? Everybody wants to get to that point. Um, but can I say that probably 90% of that work doesn't happen at that layer, right? It's back to basics, guys. Let's go back to the 1970s. You know what they said in the 1970s? They say, garbage in, garbage out, right? It's 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 even pre-70s, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> but but it like it's it's computing 101, right? Like machines are really really good at spitting back out what you put in there. Right. So what I'm really trying to say is if you want good applied intelligence, you actually need to work on TDP, not on applied intelligence. Yeah. So work on the quality of your data that's coming in. If you've got good stuff coming in, you will get the correlations. You will get the um, uh, the um, noise reduction. Right. Uh, and you'll get the anomalies and the anomalies will be relevant anomalies because you've got good telemetry data coming in. So yeah, 90% um, of AI actually occurs at the data layer, not at the at the algorithm layer. I mean, it, it, does, it does a good job, but yeah, if what you've got down below is rubbish, it'll do a good job of filtering rubbish, which means it'll spit out rubbish. So um, just always keep that in mind. And I, I think just focus more on the data the other side will come a little bit more naturally when you've got good data. All right. I, um, yeah, I, I see a few people raising hands, but um, what we request is please drop your questions in the questions um, panel and we will we'll pick them up uh, when we get a chance. Cool. One other thing I want to point out, guys, as well, very, very important. I'm sure you guys, it's, you really need to hear this very, very closely right now. I am pretty bad at remembering when to take breaks, right? I like to take a 10 minute break roughly in the middle. So around, you know, one and a half hours into the session, which I know right now is in about half an hour. Okay. So please, you have my permission, feel free, jump in, say, Dan, we need a break. Because sometimes, especially, you know, me and Ganesh will be talking about stuff. And when we get carried away, we're just going to keep going and going and going. And you guys are going to be like, oh, I need a break. This observability thing's doing my head in. I don't know how these guys work and do an observability all the time. We just do it as part of our job. They live with it, right? That's what makes us crazy, right? <laughs> so, yeah, call us on the breaks when you want the breaks. And, yeah, feel free to interrupt us with questions anytime, right? Uh, we want it to be interactive. We also want it to be fun. So, hey, here, how's this for some fun facts, right? Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but I thought I'd put this here just for a bit of fun, right? So, new relic database, NRDB. Oh, but then is it really good? Like, what can it do? I mean, really? 
could it handle scale? I don't know, guys. <laughs> it's over four petabytes of data per month. This is the last stats, right? This was from a couple of months ago. And uh, there was a chart at New Relic where uh, the ingest is the ingest is, is exponential, right? So, you know, one, you know, if you captured this data from one month ago, the, the amount now is probably so much higher. Uh, but yeah, 2.2 billion metrics and events per minute, 2.8 terabytes a day, and 30 billion web requests. All right. So we've been doing this for a while, is really what that's saying, right? Uh, and uh, yeah, New Relic handles data and knows how to handle telemetry data. So, um, quick point here, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. We got circles, we got Al. What are you doing, Dan, why are you putting up these dumb pictures, right? We're talking about monitoring versus observability. I want to highlight that when you look up uh, observability and, and when you look up monitoring on Google with regard to IT systems, they will typically talk about three pillars, right? And you can see them, they're logs, traces, metrics, right? At New Relic, we don't talk about three, we talk about four pillars because there is the there is the underlying building block of all three of those, which most monitoring doesn't even mention. It's like talking about a house without mentioning that there are bricks that make the house. And the bricks are events, right? So events ultimately make up kind of everything, right? It's, it, you know, all of these things are, are very, very closely related. I mean, if you didn't have an event, you won't have logs to report against the event, you know? Um, metrics are just a roll up of a series of events over a period of time. And a trace is looking at a specific event and how that event uh, traversed a system, right? But they're all, derivatives of events at some point. So it's kind of like the core building block that's invisible. <laughs> if you look up, uh, you know, monitoring systems and, and it, there's no mention of events in some of them, all right? Um, and sure enough, the slide that I plucked off the internet didn't mention events either, which I thought was not a bad thing because I can keep it there. Now look at that, how rude is that? You see, you get these helpful systems. Oh, we're signing you out because we think we should. No, that's not nice at all. Um, yeah, there you go. Now Octa's gonna come back and tell me something and I wanted to talk to you guys about observability and um, oh no, that's good. It remembered when I logged in earlier today, nice. Uh, here we go, here we go. Where are we? We're at the owl. I'm gonna skip past the owl, okay? Uh, monitoring, what are we doing? We're collecting info. A lot of us are at this point, right? We are all about collecting information, right? It's cool and it's great, but you gotta get past that. This is really just the first stage. Now, the other thing that I wanted to point out is that there are several different industry methodologies that we use for monitoring. And I'd be interested uh, to know what you guys uh, think about this stuff. and. Uh, if you have one that you guys use, or if this is all new to you, right? So there is the red method, the use method, right? So rates, errors, duration, utilization, saturation errors. This is what we're talking about is things that uh, the industry considers important to monitor. So we're collecting stuff, but we don't want to collect everything. We just want to collect useful stuff. So the latest one, and the newest one is this one down here, four golden signals method. Uh, and it's essentially the red method uh, with saturation as well. Okay, so um, as I said, I, it'd be great to know if you guys can throw in the chat, do you guys use one of these? <clears throat> or if, you know, if you're not sure, or if you've never heard of it, yeah, just even throw that up there as well. It'd just be good to know, right? We like to know where you guys are at in, in your monitoring. Um, where, where did this one come from, Ganesh? Because this is the latest one, right? This is the, the newest. Oops. This is the de facto industry standard, yeah? Yep, that's, uh, that's probably the one that's defined in the Google SRE handbook. Talks about Indeed. four golden signals and yeah, that's... Yeah. Um, what I want to point out, guys, is that we didn't invent this stuff, 
right? Here at New Relic, we, we didn't invent this. this. This is industry standard stuff. And what we do is we, you know, you put New Relic in place, you send your telemetry data, and we will out of the box align you to industry standards, right? And here's the best part. As industry standards and best practices change, so does the platform. That's really cool. So right now we're all about foregone signals. Oh man, have you seen the foregone signals? Oh man, I saw two of them drive past the other day. They were awesome. The other one, he was there, uh, but he was broken down, right? But you know, the foregone signals are the thing right now. They may not be in future, but I'm gonna I'm gonna log in in a minute. And you guys will have a look. I'll show you exactly. Like, look, check this out. Bang, right there, front and center, four golden signals. If you read uh, chapter six of the Google SRE handbook, it basically says, if you can only monitor four things out of your system, these are the four things you should monitor. So, you know, they've scaled a bit, right? Google. They've got a couple of data centers, you know. So they probably have a pretty good idea of about what they need to monitor to keep systems always on, which they pretty much do. Um, and this is the collecting, right? So we collect all this info, but then you really need to be able to make sense of it, right? So it's all cool that we collect info right? Uh, and we collect metrics, we collect logs, we collect traces, and of course, don't forget events, right? It's all based on events. So here we go. Metrics are just aggregated events. Logs are the details surrounding events. And the traces are the causal chain. When the event fires, what are the other cascading things that occur? So observability, understanding stuff, you know, uh, what were my sales this week? What was the activity leading up to the last error? It's being able to pull this data out of our telemetry that ultimately makes it super useful. So, I mean, another way to look at this, uh, which often works quite well for people is I think, okay, uh, what's the temperature today, right? I don't know, well, what's the temperature today, wherever you are? I think for me, it's somewhere around 20 degrees Celsius, something like that. It's reasonably cool, but a little bit warm, right? Um, you can plot what the temperature is every single day and you'll just have a data point. Cool. It's when you can start putting these things together and you can go, oh, look, it seems to be that in August every year, the temperature tends to be in this range, right? And you start gaining observability. It's the difference, and, and that's a really good indicator. That it shows the difference between monitoring and observability. We can just collect all these data points. It's cool, we're monitoring. Yeah, great. Right, I know what the temperature is like today. Great. You know, what's it going to be like in December? Right? How are you going to know that? That's observability. It's saying, I'm not just collecting data points for the sake of it. I want to answer these questions. It's going to be bloody hot in December. It's going to be like 38 degrees because <laughs> it typically always is. Right? Um, how do I have that observability? Because we have been monitoring for years and years and years, and now we can extrapolate out. Uh, you know. Um, understanding. All right. Uh, now, uh, so I did get a little bit of feedback. So some, I think most of you guys are using red. Uh, and some of you haven't heard of the monitoring standards, which is okay too. Well, I mean, the great news is, you know, it's provided out of the box once you implement New Relic, which is good. Now, I just want to go through metrics, events, logs, traces really quickly, right? And I want to then touch on telemetry data, right? And then we'll do a bit of a, a look at the whole platform. So I don't want to spend a long time on these, but, you know, here in New Relic, we do talk about MELT, right? You sometimes hear us say MELT. It's, a, it's metrics, events, logs, and traces. So this is a good indicator over here of what a metric actually is, right? So you can see events, events, you know, they, they happen when they happen, right? Uh, so when somebody types a URL and hits your website, that becomes an event, but you don't know when that's going to happen, right? It just happens when it happens. So 
um, metrics are always uh, over a period of time, right? So for it to be a metric, there has to be a time period uh, that is defined. So in, in this example, you can see we've got a count, uh, we've got a sum, right? And so, you know, there were two events uh, that happened uh, in that minute, one event in this minute, then a whole bunch of events in that minute. So we're able to then say, okay, the you know, our metric can be, you know, the count, uh, it can be the sum of them all, but it's the measurement over a period of time as opposed to the discrete events themselves, right? Um, the events, as I mentioned, are the individual telemetry uh, about the specific occurrence that happened uh, whenever it happened. And typically there'll be a lot of detail in an event. Okay, so a metric will generally be a summary, right? It'll be something like um, your web response time was 22 milliseconds, right? Um, you know, over the last hour, right? That was your average web response time. So that it's not telling you what a specific customer experienced. That would be an event. Right down here, you can see we've got the individual fields where we can drill down and events typically have a lot of data associated with them. Whereas metrics will be an aggregate of a whole bunch of events, you know, measured against certain criteria like an average or, you know, a sum or something like that, or you're just counting them up. So then you've got your logging right, which is the description of what is going on at the time of the event, all right? And, uh, you know, as, as uh, we mentioned before, we can ingest your logs alongside your events and your metrics and uh, can uh, get you a uh, correlation of specific log lines related to certain events like errors or a transaction that you're looking at uh, and pull just those logs back out. And the last one, which we haven't really talked about much, uh, is traces. So in New Relic, we have a couple of different kinds of traces. Uh, but um, yeah, the, the, the technical definition there is the execution of a job across process boundaries. So the other way of looking at it, and if I'm talking about something like a distributed trace, um, which is the fun one to describe, <laughs> it's like saying, okay, customer clicks the link, right? And a distributed trace is like saying, okay, that little request that was initiated from the little button press, where did it go? And how long did it stay at all the places where it went, right? And it's like putting a little tracker on this little packet that then goes across the network and it hits the front end and it gets processed, but then it might have to bounce through 15 different other little systems in the back. And then on top of that, it goes back to the customer, right? So it's a little bit like if you're playing a pinball machine, right? And once you hit the ball and it goes up and it starts hitting all the, you, th you think, it's like tracking all of that. It's like, wow, look where it goes. And then it comes back to you and you lose the game. <laughs> or in this case, you get, you, your, your transaction is completed, right? So a trace, as you can probably imagine, can give you a, a, quite a great deal of information about uh, the time spent in the different processes of uh, you know your systems, right, and and how things are actually put together when it comes to responding to requests, because like we said, customer doesn't care that they click the link and it took you know one second or two second, right? They they they're not going to say, oh well, you know, it was that subsystem there that was down and therefore I'm okay with it. They're just going to say slow, didn't like it, or it was quick and I didn't even notice, so it's fine. Right, it's up to us to then be able to work out specifically where it's problematic. Now, I already mentioned this uh, events uh, versus metrics. I, I sort of mentioned that there's a lot more data in events, right? They're very, very high fidelity. Uh, that being the case, they also have uh, quite high storage requirements. Okay, so it's essentially described in full, right? And we store the whole thing. So we don't want to store events forever, right? Because it clogs up the system. And quite frankly, they're not important to you. 
I know you're going to go, what? Yes, they are. I need my events. Yeah, of course you do. But you don't need them forever. All right. You only need them for a period of time. Metrics are, you know, that's the much smoother way of, you know, just, you know, you get the general, you get the general trends and how things were going, right? Um, and this sort of leads me into the next point as to what we should do with telemetry data. And is telemetry data the same? Is telemetry data different? It's different, okay? We got a, I got a nice picture here, right? I, I didn't get this, I, I pulled this from one of the New Relic, uh, <laughs> one of the New Relic uh, presentations. But this, I, I love this, this really highlighted a point and it like a little light bulb went on for me when I started New Relic so long ago. Telemetry data is not a lake, right? It is not this type of data that you want to put into permanent storage for archiving and later auditing. That's not what this is about. This is about performance and troubleshooting data. You want real time data. You want the data to flow, right? Just like a healthy river, a healthy river flows. It's got a nice good current to it. Let it go, right? You don't need to hold on to everything forever, right? It's also, I mean, it's, um, you know, my, my, my girlfriend, she's a DBA, right? So she, she's all about the lake, right? <laughs> but she thinks like that too, right? She, every, like she can, she retains everything. She, she remit, do you know what? Six months ago, you said this and you said that. I'm like, did I? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> my brain does work like telemetry database. I forget about what I did a week ago because it's gone. It was in the past. I just have the general, you know, I got the general feeling of it. I've got the metrics. I know what the trend was. Last week was okay. <laughs> I can't remember the individual <laughs> events. You know, I don't need to keep that. You know, there's limited space up here, right? So yeah, different data gets treated differently. And our telemetry data is not data that needs to be kept in perpetuity. Uh, it's something that we need to know at the moment how things are going uh, and we can make decisions based on it, right? We can gain more understanding on it. And what we really want to do with our telemetry data is not hold it so we can look into history, but we want to use it to analyze the future. So telemetry data is for looking forward. That's the cool thing about it. Uh, anyway, let's uh, let's see what else I can, what else I can do here. Oh, I think it's time for us to jump into. Yeah, well, I tell you what, we'll, let's jump into the platform. We'll have a bit of a look around, and then we'll go on break and come back and look at some more things. All right. Um, hey Ganesh, do you have some favorite apps? Like New Relic One apps. Because I so I was gonna come here, right? Talk about new like apps. My and favorite thought, app is yeah. So my favorite one is the um, account maturity one and um, the site analyzers. I love those. Both oh, yeah. of them. Yeah. All right. Um, do you want to jump in? to the platform and, and maybe show us this. I, I, yeah, I, I like account maturity as well. It's, um, wouldn't you guys love it if when you bought a product, the product itself had a function in it that was able to tell you, you're not using this thing as well as you could be. Wouldn't that be cool if every product had that? Well, yeah, New Relic has one of those. We call it account maturity, but it's really just saying, hey guys, you're using the product. Why not use it to its best of its ability? So uh, it's good for us because it allows us to help you guys a lot, but it's available to you guys. So um, Ganesh is gonna, is gonna show us. And um, sure. all right, I'll, I'll pass the screen over to you and uh, we will do our first demos. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let me see, I can share my screen there. You know what, this is the first time I'm sharing my screen and I find it really difficult on webinar. Yeah. 
go to webinar is not friendly for uh, <laughs> presenters. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just try to. Uh... Where is the screen share option? Come on. Uh, it should be over on the little menu thing, and it will be like the third one down. You got your mic, and then you got your camera, and then you got your screen as the third one down. Yeah, I clicked on that. Um, so is my screen visible with the cameras and everything? Is it, is it the one that's visible with? I don't know. I can't. No, something. you're you're not sharing your screen out at the moment. Yeah. And you are listed. You know what? I'm doing this. Uh, yeah, I, th I think I'm not the present. Oh, there you go. Now I'm. I, now I'm. You, you should be able to just pull it. But yeah, I've I've pushed it over to you. All there right, there you go. Now you see it now. now. You should be able to see it. Yeah, perfect. Good. All, All right, right, guys. So, so we, this we, is we, the platform. A, yeah, we've got a demo now. Yeah. So the very first thing that I always like to do as part of the demo is. Um, a lot of developers don't like the light view of any website. So we also have a dark mode, which all the developers would love. Look at that. <laughs> that looks beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, just for the purposes of our, um, you know, the proper visibility in the meeting, I'm just going to keep it in the light mode for now. And um, two apps that are, that I really, okay. so. Basically, this is the platform, and like you're seeing, this this is the home screen where you get to see all your mm, all the different types of entities that are instrumented. You get to see, you know, all the microservices and different hosts that you have. Um, basically, the infrastructure on which your services are running. If you have a mobile application, you'll be able to see that here. Um, again, because this is the Explorer view, you can see only the starred ones here, right? The ones that are, that are your favorites, the one that you visit longer, or the one that you favorite for yourself. Just like, just like the bookmarks that you have on the browser, right? Um, the feature that Dan was talking about, which is um, programmability, the apps, right? So there's a there's a little icon here which says apps here. So if you click on this one, you get to a page where you see a bunch of apps and all of these apps are available for anyone who's using the platform. These are all the public app, public applications, right? And my favorite application that I, that I just spoke uh, to Dan about, which is account maturity, which is available for public and allows all the customers to use it. And the beauty of this app is, um, you know, telling all the users that, Hey, you know what? You are using New Relic, which is good, but are you using it to the extent that the tool is allowing you to do it, right? Are you? Yes, you have this tool. You're using APM, but are you following all the best practices, right? And we really like to gamify this, and then we give a scoring against each one of them, and then we say on this screen, um, hey, this is your account, and within this account. You're using APM, you're using browser, synthetics. But you know what? There are a few things that you can still improve. And for example, on your infrastructure, you have your score out of 100 is only 67. And that's when things would make, uh, because everyone loves numbers, right? So if I tell someone that, hey, you're, um, you know, the thing that you cooked just now is really good. And if I say, you know what? It's about nine out of 10. So that that that's the kind of compliment that you can give, right? And, and and it's ten on ten. So everybody loves numbers when you quantify things. And this account maturity scores that you're seeing here are the ones that New Relic is giving to the customers based on a set of best practices and recommendations that we have, and tells hey you're using infrastructure and here is what we think it is. Sixty seven is the score that we think of. And why is it 67 is something that New Relic will explain you in detail in the next tab here. So if you see this here, it says you have 17 hosts reporting this data, but you know what? None of these are using the recent infrastructure agent, right? And I can click on this further and then it's going to give me all of this data here. This is the server IP. You're not using the latest version of your agent and um, you know, 
what is a good thing that you're doing? What's the what's what's the thing that you're not doing in the right way? Right? Tells the users that you know what are the areas that they can improve. They can say, hey, cloud integration is enabled, which is good. It gives you insights into all the infrastructure that you have right now from the cloud perspective. And you have custom attributes. That's basically you'll get to know how you tag your entities on uh, on New Relic. And yeah, so there are a bunch of a bunch of um, you know uh, prerequisites um, or the best practice um, um, criteria that we have based on which a score is defined. Um, Dan, you want to add anything here? I just gave one example of just infrastructure. Is there anything else that you want to talk about here? Um. <clears throat> For the moment, I think we can we can stop here. And yes, we will come back. Sure. We'll, we'll maybe have a look at a couple of extra apps as well. I'm just mindful of the time because it's coming up to 2.30 now for me, which is around about our halfway mark. Now, um, just before we go on a break, I just want to make sure we've answered questions, if there were any questions that came through. Um, sure. Uh, there is one actually. Um, if you want to jump back to the favorites page, right? Or the home page. Mm -hmm. um, go back to the home page and we can have a look at that because one of the questions was if an organization has multiple New Relic accounts, right? Um, set up for, you know, different parts of a solution or maybe different parts of the business, uh, you know, will they still be able to correlate and see that data across their whole stack? And um, so, yeah, you guys can see uh, Ganesh has now gone to uh, his homepage, and yeah, you notice where he's where he's just gone, uh, and it says the account there, right? So he's got Demotron V2. So this is pretty common. You, uh, your organization might have multiple different accounts, and uh, you can easily flick between them, as uh, he's showing you there. Uh, you'll also notice the second field on that uh, on that page. So you've got all the different app names, and then right next to that, you've got the account that it's in. So if you've favorited a bunch of stuff in different accounts, yeah, you'll see them uh, all listed there on your favorites. Um, so, and and the, uh, the New Relic One apps, they're all across account as well. So that's another way of being able to pull data in from different New Relic accounts and correlating it together. Uh, so yes, uh, you you can do it, and it doesn't hinder your ability to see. Uh, in in fact, actually, if you want to know a little bit about the history of it, um, your question this is a really good question. Actually, your question was you know was asked quite a number of years ago, and it kind of gave birth to New Relic One, right? <laughs> one of the things about New Relic One, like before that, we used to have New Relic, right? And we had New Relic APM and you know New Relic. We had all the different products, but they were bounded by the accounts, right? And you, we didn't have that cross-account visibility. And because that was a limitation that we needed to overcome, we released in May last year, New Relic 1, which gave us the cross-account functionality. So yeah, the question was a good one. It was asked quite a while back and it was seen as a limitation and it was overcome. Uh, when New Relic 1 uh, was released a while ago. So yeah, good one. Um, uh, There's another question here that says, uh, we'd like to keep three months of data in New Relic and retain the logs for regulatory purposes. Um, can we integrate TDP to write the data into any cloud storage for archiving purpose? Yep, so the retention period of any data that you ingest into New Relic platform uh, purely depends on the um, um, on the pricing tier that you're in. Um, the default ones are the the events and logs get retained up to a certain period of time. Um, I believe for all the metrics, it's 395 days, which is like 13 months, and for logs, it is 30 days, um, and it is very much possible to extend the retention based on the regulatory requirements that you have. And for archiving purpose, sending the data to cloud storage, for example, let's say AWS S3 is available within the enterprise tier of New Relic. So yeah, and then, uh, basically, depending what you've subscribed yeah. to, uh, it can be done, True. yes. Uh, if an organization has adopted New Relic as a tool, but developers are not instrumenting the code at all, um, you know, limiting how useful can be, neural can be. How do you change the culture of the organization to instrument as you build? 
yeah, it is. It's definitely a tough question. Um, I would say. Um, so Paint in the my opinion, black. That's how you change the culture. Paint the windscreen black <laughs> on their car. Just paint it black. That's what you need to do. That'll change the culture straight away. <laughs> you need to see where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, but in my in my opinion, Stephen, um, like I said, I was I was once a customer of Neuralink, um, dealing with develop, develop development teams, and then ensuring that they have their code instrumented. It is tough. It is tough. I definitely um, you know agree with that. Um, you know, it's it's just the it's just the realization that the development team needs to get from um, um, the value of the solution, and people people always like to learn it the hard way, right? So once you hit the production issue and you do not have enough insights into your code, and that's when you'd be like, ah, oh, I, I should I should have done this instrumentation in past, right? People like to learn it the hard way, but as long as they realize the value of um, the solution. Uh, during the development cycle, it's always good. But as 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 a as the owner of observability, and um, as a person who is who is handling DevOps, um, I always took the step, and then try to explain it, conduct some sessions um, and uh, enablement sessions to the developer development team, show them the value of the solution, and that's how they started adapting it. And few others who did not adapt it, yeah, they learned it the hard way, production issue, and then the instrumentation. Yeah, um, I have a few thoughts on that as well. I think I I agree with you totally. I th I think a lot of the time, it's a the the issue is is um, it's it's a time thing uh, that they have a problem with, in that they feel like oh you know the instrumentation side of things is an add on. It's an extra. It'll take me more time. Uh, I can release now without needing to do that. Right. Uh, and this will add 10% extra time. You know, my release will be slower. And yeah, to change the culture, they need to see that there's a correlation to, well, you add, yeah, you do. You do add a little bit of time here. And then you gain back a lot of time there, right? Um, and I think ultimately they need to see that that it's not the, the need for it is long past ever going away. It, it, it's never going to go away that you don't need an instrument. In fact, it's going to become more and more and more important. And ultimately, it needs to be if you release without instrumentation, it's incomplete code. It needs to be seen that way. So, well, you haven't finished, right? It's an incomplete product as opposed to, well, no, I've shipped the complete product and this, I didn't put your ad on because that's not relevant to me. So, well, no, you didn't finish, right? So I think even in terms of, you know where I'm going with this, right, <laughs> Ganesh? I think, you know, yeah, yeah. even in terms of when you originally, you know, spec out your project with, what the requirements are, right? The, it needs to be in the requirements that the thing is instrumented, right? Because, and and there's another side to this as well. The other side to it that can get resistance is something that you'll typically see with um, service level management, right? Uh, and from a developer side, they can see it as, um, oh, but, you know, service level management can can sometimes be seen as like a, a, a blame type of a um, type of a construct and and that's not really what it's about and it's not ever what it was supposed to be it's all about moving faster more safely and more efficiently right. so better release of better code right and when you realize that the instrumentation is not this uh afterthought is nuisance thing that i have to do but rather this is how we release production code it's actually just the way it's done right and this saves us loads of time on the other side 
and it makes it a lot easier for us to diagnose our own issues. So, you know, your uh, yeah. your future you will thank you, <laughs> right? <laughs> but it's your yeah. future you, right? Because when that thing comes back with errors, you're the one that need to fix it. So you you literally are doing yourself a favor uh, <laughs> to put the instrumentation in, right? And, and actually, mm. you, you're the one that gains the most. Um, you put a little bit of investment up front uh, and you gain uh, you gain enormously in the background. And a lot of it is just, I mean, who doesn't want to see really how their app is performing, right? And yeah. I, I, the other thing to that I find is I feel like it adds so much value when you really go full stack and you get the front end telemetry coming in. I find that to be more exciting than, I mean, if you're doing your stack observability only, you're seeing your app, you've probably got a general idea on that anyway, you know, and then your infra, maybe you care or you don't care about that. But what's really, really nice is to see the utilization from the customer side, right? And I mean, who doesn't want to have an app and then see how it, how it's actually utilized and how it's actually performing out in the wild? Correct. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I see a couple of requests that to um, um, you know have a break for ten minutes. Yes. So yes, definitely. Uh, <laughs> there are there are there are two or three unanswered questions which we will answer once we are back from break. Dan, if that's okay with you. Definitely. Let's go on a break, guys. Yeah. So uh, let's come back in ten minutes time. All right. All right. See you all shortly.
Are we back, guys? Everybody here? All right. <clears throat> Let's see, where were we at? Um, yeah, we were talking about changing the culture of the organization to include instrumentation. Uh, yeah, very, very tricky question to uh, answer comprehensively. Uh, but there was a suggestion came through as well. So somebody else put up a comment saying, um, uh, where was it? I did see a comment. Yeah. So one said, uh, just 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 pick one team and then start uh, start working with them, and yes. then radiate the results. Yes, I can't see the comment now, but it, that's what it said. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, maybe if you if you do have one team that's a little bit more open to the idea, uh, get them to roll it out. Once they start seeing the benefits, uh, it should be pretty natural that they will start championing it to all their colleagues, saying, "Hey, this has made my life a lot easier." you guys might want to do it yourselves um so yeah look at the end of the day it's it is actually about making life easier um uh, it just seems like oh well, okay there's a couple of extra steps we need to do in the beginning but it does result in uh making life easier so um yeah maybe if there's a little bit of resistance yeah i guess go with the go 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 where you're finding the least and and uh, try to spread it out from there. Um, I think that looked like it was all the questions, I think. Yeah, I think that's, that's most of yep. it. All right, great. Good stuff. Uh, let's see. So, uh, now th there was a couple other things, uh, you know, what, um, I might get you to, if you if you're okay to keep demoing stuff, I I'll, I'll get you to demo it, Ganesh. It's, uh, gives me a little bit of a break too. It's good. Uh, but I'll tell you what, before just before you go into the demo, I, I got to give you things to demo about, right? So I want to I want to uh, show you this. Uh, I'm just going to share out my screen. All right, so if you can see my screen, uh, one thing I wanted to introduce you to was, uh, sorry, things that New Relic change quite fast, right? Uh, and, and sometimes that even includes terminology, okay? So we, I'm showing you up here on the screen, uh, we've got this cool guy called the Entity Explorer. I don't even think we call him the Entity Explorer anymore, is that right, Ganesh? I think we could just call him, he's just the Explorer now. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, he, he's still in, huh? Just the Explorer. Yeah, yeah, he was Entity Explorer. In the beginning, he was Entity Explorer, and it seemed really cool. But actually, when you say it a lot of times, Entity Explorer, Entity Explorer, and then you're saying, what's an entity, you know? And it's quite hard to say Entity a lot of times. So anyway, he's just Explorer now. But you can see these uh, these slides. You notice they're, they're screenshots of uh, what was the Entity Explorer, but he's the Explorer, okay? Uh, there are some really cool things about this, right? Um, Ganesh was just showing you on the homepage on his favorites, right? So anything that you have starred will be on that homepage, right? Um, but we have a number of different views in the Explorer that are designed to show you very specific things and they will be so helpful to you. So for example, this baby over here, right? Um, this is, um, well, we, we call it, look out um, but this is a view that we can very easily get to from within Explorer and we can we can actually get you a view of this that will show you your four golden signals for your apps right and you can see here that the um, you know it shows it up as bubbles right so you get to see the scope of whatever the app is in terms of size uh, and then you get to see whether its performance is higher or lower, 
right, than what it was an hour ago. Okay, so this is designed just to surface up anything that is immediately noticeable to be quite different to how it was an hour ago. All right. Um, so I, I want to show that, and just, just before, so we'll do that, and then I also want to show the one of the other views. So we've got this guy here. This is fantastic when you are looking into uh, troubleshooting situations where where you've got some alerting going on, and you want to diagnose the alerts and you want to fix these. So this is a, an alert centric view of uh, your instrumented entities uh, in New Relic. So that's another thing that we're going to look at. And well, yeah, and the other one that we can do, uh, which we'll probably do, I mean, we might touch on it today, but we'll do more of it uh, later on, is we will show you in the uh, summary screens, uh, you can see all the related entities uh, that are associated with the object that you're looking at at the moment. But uh, for now, I'm going to pass it back over to you, Ganesh, if we can maybe just jump into the home page and let's look through Explorer and see the different views on Explorer. And what will be really cool as well is let's look at the different views when selecting different entities. Because the one of the awesome things about New Relic is it, it's like, well, it's going to show you relevant things depending on the entity type, right? So for example, we're not going to show you web transaction time when you're looking at an underlying host. That's the wrong kind of thing to show you for a host, right? But we might show you things like CPU utilization on a host. We're not going to show you CPU utilization when you're looking at a browser entity, right? So it, it's got all the right things for all the right entities. I'm going to stop talking now uh, and I'm going to pass it on to you. Ganesh, let me just grab the, uh, there you go. You should be able to take over. There you go. Fantastic. All right. Sure, I think we already saw the screen some time ago. Um, and like I showed you, these are all the APM services that you have, that you have um starred so you basically you made it a favorite so that um you can get the first level view on the um, top services that you have um on your priority list and similarly because everything is treated as an entity be it a microservice that you have instrumented for apm or be it a host that is running or be it a mobile application you would see all of them here and the default view which is the favorite view here right but can it, can we just increase the the size on the font a little bit there, Ganesh? Let's just um, sure. sure. Yeah, that um, zoom in just a touch would be there good. You go. Yeah, yep. it's kind of nice. <laughs> cool. Oops. Uh, there you go. Yeah. So you have all of these entities here, which are reporting, and these are all your favorites. But then. Um, under this account, you might you might also have different types of entities. Like for example, if I just want to see everything that's under APM along with the ones that are my favorite, just click on APM on the left panel, and then you will see all the services that are instrumented, right? Just not APM and just not hosts. If you have any containers running, um, because of the um, auto detection of the infrastructure agent that's running on the host, all the containers are detected, and it's just going to list out all of them here. On the screen, right? If you want to take a look at all the entities here, there is a huge list that you can see, which is ongoing and it probably would be like 20 or 30 pages. But now, the other view that Dan just mentioned, which is a really good view, which is Navigator, right? If you go to Navigator, it, it gives you this beautiful view where it, while it's already categorizing different types of entities that are part of this account. It also gives you a quick idea on what's the status of each of these entities. So, for example, if I have, if I consider APM here, I have around 46 services that are running. And out of 46 microservices that are instrumented, I have four services that are showing me an alert condition of critical alert condition here, right? And just um, taking my mouse, uh, taking my cursor on top of this APM service, 
it gives me a first level information on why is this showing an alert condition here as critical it shows me that you know what you have an alert condition on this application that is your abdex is if it is less than one for about 60 minutes show i'll show a critical alert and that's exactly what the alert condition is going to show here right similarly for the other one here there you go there was an alert condition that was triggered at some time around 8 18 a.m and then that warning condition has um, got escalated to a critical condition because it's been there for like 20 minutes and so on and so forth for every for for every application you will be able to see this this is another example of a different type of alert where the background throughput has been like less than 100 for like five minutes when it triggered a, um, a warning alert and then there is and then there's a critical alert that got triggered because of a different type of condition that was that was set on this application right so so this this one basically gives you um, a high level overview on how your applications are behaving at at this point of time right and you can select you know to if, if you really want to see the latest data for the last like last 30 minutes select the last 30 minutes and the status will be updated and this one just refreshes the data and then updates all the entity health here right and if you just want to see apm click just on apm along with the navigator view you can see just the just just the apm data here right and the third view that we spoke about is lookout so clicking on lookout um you will see the golden signals that um dan just mentioned about so one is throughput another one is response time and the third one is error rate saturation comes with uh with the infrastructure so for now to understand how this view works the bigger the size of the bubble that you're seeing here um the higher the throughput and if there is any comparison that we try to do here with like so here the data is being compared with uh, the last five minutes of the data is being compared with the preceding 60 minutes for all the 46 reporting entities here. And as of now, there is no data, there, there is not much of a difference, right? And for example, if I consider this one, um, and if it says that 60 minutes ago, the data, the, uh, the difference is, let's say the throughput, whatever the throughput that I have now is way higher than what I had 60 minutes ago this one is going to be in like purplish color right and now if i'm seeing a throughput which is way lesser compared to what i had 60 minutes ago this one is going to be something like orangish right and like like you can see here the legend right i'm just going to try and then get a, a proper comparison report here let's say um you know let me try to get some proper comparison here uh, Just the other thing on that as well, guys. Uh, so some of you said that you were familiar with the red method, which is rate errors duration. Uh, that's essentially what that is right there, right? Um, we are tracking rates error, uh, the rate, which is your throughput, uh, your errors, uh, which is errors there, and then your duration, which is your response time. Uh, and we also have saturation as well. Uh, the saturation appears when you're looking at infrastructure entities. Okay, mm. so um, we, we're showing you all the relevant metrics for the specific entity because we're looking at the middle layer right now, right? So when we're talking full stack, we're looking at the different layers. This is the app layer. So at the app layer, we're looking at throughput response time errors. <clears throat> this is all out of the box, okay? Uh, you don't have to create any dashboards or anything like this. It will automatically go through and correlate uh you know the the events from now compared to one hour prior to see if there are any anomalies all you need to do to get all of this stuff appearing is to instrument the app in the first place that's it and that then you get right. all this stuff yep yep now you can now you can see here there's an example that says um you know the tower phoenix is one of the microservices that was instrumented and it's saying, hey, the response time is like 47% higher compared to what it was 60 minutes ago. Right? And that's that's like little purplish here that you can see. Yep. Yeah. Um, there is not much of a difference because these are all demo applications. They more or less behave the same um, and you know, every now and then. That's the reason you're not seeing any big differences. But then 
as a simple example um, for one service that you can see here the response time because it went higher it immediately highlighted this and then you can see hey this one the response time is slightly higher compared to what it was 60 minutes ago um, and if i go to a similar lookout view here um, you have different types of views that you can save that's the default view that you just saw some time ago but when it comes when 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 you go to the explorer and you can select lookout here it brings you to a place where you can define what kind of view that you want right this is more comprehensive this is more customizable and now as you're seeing under this account you're looking at the data for the last five minutes and you're comparing it with last 60 minutes and this one clearly gives you a difference saying at our washington had response time higher response time higher I'm just going to increase this um, data here so that we get more colors on the screen let me see if i can do that like six hours ago um you know yeah i think like i said because this one is this one is a demo app there is not much of a color uh, comparison here let me see if i can get to a different account that has some good data oh there you go <clears throat> i get another comparison here that says response time is crazily high for fulfillment service um, compared to one hour ago in the last 30 minutes the data that i have but compared to the last one hour this one is so basically this view makes it very easier for you to understand um, every, everyone's favorite is that is a time series graph right that one shows you okay things are going fine things are going fine okay things went bad and yeah things are going fine right the graph while the graph gives you a clear idea on um, a proper comparison a uh, proper trend view but this one is more of a comparison saying 30 minutes ago yes my response times were like 30 milliseconds and now at this point of time my response times are like 45 milliseconds which is fairly good but is it really impacting my customers or not is something that you can take a look at this and because this 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 view is um, um is little more colorful um executors would really love to uh, see something like this on, on on bigger screens on the floor um is there any other view that you want me to show uh dan uh yes definitely i'm just uh actually i tell you what i'm just looking at some questions coming through um mm -hmm. one question came through i think would benefit from seeing the service maps on a service because the question comes through can we monitor an end-to-end uh, business process, right? Like, and see the topology of the apps that make up part of that process. So, uh, if you maybe just show a um, a service map, that would be kind of cool because we'd be able to uh, show where you can easily get that information. Sure, sure, definitely. So this is one one such service um, back a backend service that is that is instrumented here. And to answer your question, um, you know. Can we discover and monitor end to end business process? Yes. Um, when you instrument all of your back end services and your front end services properly, you will be able to get the end to end view of a complete transaction, um, uh, a complete transaction processing. So, for example, I'm going to the billing service. Um, and uh, you know what? Actually, let me go to order composer service because this one talks about the front end as well and while this one shows you how your back-end service is performing there's also something called as service map here and clicking on service map will give you the complete transaction trace on where did it start where did it go and what uh, what all entities are involved in processing this transaction right so now as you can see here the order processing here is is, is one back-end service that made a call to order composer service and from order composer service, there are numerous calls that are made to email notifications, delivery, packaging room, bubble wrap, et cetera, et cetera. And then here you can see the complete, um, you know, request flow and request processing of, um, of one web transaction, right? That's what you're seeing here. And um, if, I, if I further can answer your question on, um, if you want to monitor the end-to-end -end of, so, if this order composer service is 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 getting like let's say 10 different calls and this service map tells you 
every single component that is involved in processing all 10 different calls but if you're looking for an individual transaction or an individual web transaction how is that getting processed there is another concept called as distributed tracing which we will cover in um, in the next session when we talk about apm All right, pretty cool, thank you. Uh, let's see, we had another one here. Uh, oh, here's a good one, so if, um, all right, we want to instrument a monolithic app, right? And the question comes in, can we do that and represent it as microservices? But it's a monolithic app. Um you can do that but it depends it depends on how you're instrumenting the application so now if you have a monolithic application which is taking care of let's say um if there are like 20 or 30 transactions that you have right um when i say web transactions i'm talking about the api calls that can be um, um api calls that takes care of sorry not not api calls pieces of code that that calls each other like big monolithic app Mm -hmm. So when you're when the way that you're instrumenting this, when you instrument this one, uh, because this is a monolithic app, you make that extra effort to instrument individual pieces of code, add custom attributes, and using the custom attribute, you can build your own visualization that shows it as different components calling each other, and that's possible. And that's pretty much possible. All right. Um, I'm just thinking if there's yeah, any follow-up questions to that. Yeah, look out, look out is an add-on package. Uh, get a message the cable that you're trying to access is not available based on the current plan. Um, Lookout view is um, is 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 a curated um, um, visualization that's available with New Relic, and I believe it's available with. Uh, with, with only with the licensed versions is that is that right dan i'm pretty sure yeah so uh look out as well as things like you know apm uh, browser mobile <laughs> synthetics these are uh all those curated pages that are that are out of the box displaying you dashboards that have meaningful info in them they're available for full stack observability users, right? So if we remember back to the start of the session, that's why I start that way and I talk about TDP and then you've got FSO on top and then you've got uh, applied intelligence because it also sort of uh, indicates your level of licensing. So you can come in at the TDP level, which allows you to ingest information. You can start to build a single source of truth. You can build your own dashboards. You can write queries. Like You, you can control your data. You can uh, even write your own apps right, to consume your own data. If you want to then use the full New Relic curated experience, that's where uh, you go and you become a, an FSO user, right, a full stack observability user. Um, and um, I'm not even sure what the cost on that is. It's it, it, There's a, a couple of different, it's a per month, you pay a per month subscription uh, for the user and then that user is a full stack observability user and they will get all those extra, uh, all those extra pages that will give them an out of the box experience so that they can, you know, more easily do, uh, you know, troubleshooting on performance and errors. Yeah. And then there's another question can we add lookouts to dashboard via an rql um so to answer i I'll, i'm going to answer this question in two different ways so the first one is um lookout by itself is a curated view and um you this view by itself cannot be added to a different dashboard right and the other way to then and, and the second part of this the answer is um an rql is this query language where you can fetch a lot of data fetch fetch different data from different components that are saved in our NRDB, right? So using NRQL, you can definitely query the data. And once you have the data available with you, you can write the comparisons, right? For example, right now I'm talking about saying last, last 30 minutes and then preceding six hours. And how you can write a query is, if you, if you really want to get, get this kind of data using NRQL, you can just say, you know, um, you know, select count of star uh, from say transaction and then say 
since last 30 minutes um and you say compare with you know um compare with 60 minutes ago and this one would give you very similar data as what you have now and you can use any kind of visualizations and then 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 show um, what you want since 30 minutes not sorry not since last 30 minutes yeah you can just say compare with um let me just get this ago. Uh, 30 minutes ago and compare with see that's what that, that's what happens after you come back from a holiday mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so Ganesh is just showing you why you should use tab complete. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, to answer your question on this one, yes, it's it is possible. So you can just do the comparisons like this and then say, you know, there are there are different types of visualizations that are available. If you want to put it in a time series, you just want to present this number in a dashboard. Yeah, and this one shows you what's the growth percentage here. Cool. How is it going to be different from Azure Monitor or uh, AWS CloudWatch? Very interesting question. Um, so, be it for Azure or be it for AWS or um, or be it GCP, um, the kind of integration that we have is that there is something called as a cloud integration that New Relic has. Um, New Relic has as part of infrastructure where you can connect your Azure, AWS, or um, be it government cloud or be it, in fact, we also have Alibaba in few regions. Um, you can connect your account to this. And for example, if you want to connect to AWS, there are two different ways of how you can connect your AWS account to this. Either you can do it through CloudWatch, wherein New Relic is going to make API calls to your account and then fetch all the metrics that you want. And the second one is, you know, you can have a metrics team set up between AWS and the New Relic account. That's not that that is going to help you get data in real time, and um, there is no API throttling that AWS can stop New Relic from getting all the data real time. So yeah, Azure Monitor and AWS CloudWatch not just gives you um, the infrastructure metrics that you have hosted on your uh, cloud service provider account, but it can also give you information on other services. So for example, Lambda function. Right, and like you can see here, these are all the different types of integrations available for AWS. You can configure your API gateway. Um, you know, you can look at your DynamoDB stats, Lambda function, and everything that's possible. Uh, every, every other service that you're using on AWS. All right, that's more or less the questions that we have, uh, Dan. All right, thank you very much for that. Uh, let me see what else I wanted to cover. So we've looked at uh, the lookout view. We've had a look at the alerts view. Um, the other thing that I wanted to introduce today was uh, something that's relatively new to the platform. It's only been around for a couple of months, uh, but it is a really awesome tool. It's called Workloads. <clears throat> um, I think Ganesh should probably like it as well. Um, <laughs> but um, it also, it also, so we've got this, uh, so is this is a thing, it's called workloads. And it actually leads us into then another discussion that we can have on an even newer product, which is called the errors inbox. So we can talk about those two things because you actually need to have a workload before you can, uh, you can have what we call an errors inbox. And, it is kind of how it sounds. It's it's like saying, all right, I've got this, I've got this uh, big service made up of all these different components, and I want all the errors related to this thing to be correlated together because ultimately they all make up the same service. So that becomes a specific errors inbox for a workload. But if you ever wanted to know, well, why would I want to create a workload? There's a hell of a lot of really good reasons. But now there's another, even newer reason. <laughs> which is the area inbox. So uh, we are looking at the workload views page at the moment. So when you're in your early one, you go from the home page uh, all the way across to the right little drop down, you can see workload views, right? That's where Ganesh has taken us. And uh, we've got a nice pretty tile view at the moment. 
Um, but uh, if you want to maybe jump into one of these that's working, or if you want to create one, uh, that's fine to do as well. Uh, I'll, I'll let you do it whichever way. Yep. All right, so maybe, maybe while you're doing that, so I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit as to what's going on. So what workloads are in New Relic, you see we, we name them, uh, and they are a collection of entities, right, that work together to provide a service. Okay, so you might have, um, you know, a, a, a login service, for example, that's made up of four different apps uh, and two hosts, maybe, I don't know. Uh, you can create, you know, so I mean, that would be six entities, right? You've got your four apps and then you'd have your two hosts underneath. Uh, you can manage them as the six different entities or you can add them all together into one workload. Now, one of the things I really like about it is this allows you to put all the layers together. Okay, so let's say I've got, you know, a, a customer facing application that's instrumented all the way through, all right? I can add the front end as a, as a front end entity. I can add my app, right? If I've got multiple instances of the app, I can add all of them in. I can then add my underlying host or my containers that serve the app. Now, not only that, I can add the synthetic monitors that will periodically poll my application. I can add dashboards related to this overarching service. So everything that is now related to that one contained service made up of a few entities can all be grouped together into a single workload, which is awesome in a lot of different ways, uh, as Ganesh is gonna show you in a second you will end up with a curated performance view, right? So depending on the entities that you pick, different charts will appear, uh, which is great, right? We're obviously gonna show you the most relevant things uh, for each of the entities that have been selected. Uh, alerts that are created on the individual entities will roll up to the workload itself. So let's say, you've got a critical alert firing on a host, right? Uh, your apps are still okay, and all of them are contained within one workload. That workload will go critical because one of the entities inside it is critical. So that's where you've got that workload tile view, which we started out at, right? Now, if we have a look, at what Ganesh has just done. And you might want to run us through it because I was just explaining things. I wasn't looking at what you're doing. Oh, sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So show us what you've done. So, you've added some services, some uh, apps and some hosts, I can see. Yep, so what I did here is, um, you know, I just I just picked up my four different type, four different microservices that I'm running. Um, I have a fulfillment service, I have a bubble wrap service, shipment label and proxy vest. All these four services that belong to one application and all four services are running on these three different hosts. So I know I know that these are running on the, these three different hosts. And then I also have a browser application, which is the one that actually makes calls to this backend services. Additionally, I also have a synthetic service where I'm going to check all the APIs, are they working fine or not? So what I did was I just added all of these entities to my workload. Um, so, and then how I did this, I'm just going to quickly show you how I did this one. So all I have to do is create a workload and then give a name here. And then it's going to list out every single entity that I have within this account here. But now what I am going to do is I will say, hey, I have my APM service. So I, all I just do is I just type APM and then select services APM here. So it shows me all the 47 entities that I have. I pick up saying, I, I, could, I could probably be belonging only just to the fulfillment service. I'm, I'm a developer who belongs to fulfillment service, right? So I just go to fulfillment service and then I just click on add here. And then I say, because my fulfillment service is also called by the delivery service, I want to know the health of the delivery service as well. So I would add the delivery service as well. And fulfillment service internally makes a call to um, inventory service. So I want to know if my target service is also available or not. 
So I added three entities now, three APM services. And then I want to add the host for this. So all I can just do is type host and then click on hosts here, which is on top. And I know what my service is running on. I know my service is running on, say, uh, Ganesh, I lost you. You know, one of these services here, one of these servers here. So I'm just going to add this, um, add this entity here. Okay, please ignore that one. Um, that was just probably a glitch from my side. Is my audio still? Um, um, can you can you hear me? I, I lost Dan? you. I lost you for a moment. I lost you for a moment, but you seem to be back now. I lost you for about. 10 seconds okay, there cool. I think. is the screen also visible yeah everything's visible i was able to see everything i just i lost your audio okay, for about perfect. 10 seconds okay <laughs> so yeah i just added the server on which my um, microservices hosted i just clicked on add here that's it and then um, you know i have a synthetic monitor that is set up to check all my uh, if all my apis are working or not so i just added this that's all and then i said I gave it a name saying something test and are you and then I just laid it on create on workload and what this did is help me I'm just going to discard these changes because I already have the workload created and what this did is this this just created a workload um, um, workload for me here let me just go to workloads and then try to find this one the one that I just created I just created something by the name and are you uh, oops the name is a little different it is name is M R U. Uh, where do I have that? Uh, oh, this is showing only for this account. Let me just go to all accounts. We have numerous accounts here, so yeah, I'd say it is it's possible that um, you're not seeing all of them. Let me just go to my. There you go. And are your demo workload that I just created? I click on this, and it's these 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 are exactly the same set of entities that I added to the workload. And currently, because everything is healthy, it's showing me green everywhere, right? So, but the the use case of this workload is that um, if a developer or a team, or uh, for example, now they call it as tribes, for a, in, in in a lot of companies, that if I have a tribe who's taking care of just the checkout functionality they would be worried about how things are working just for their checkout functionality sources that are calling checkout and checkout service the destination that the other services that it is calling so basically the service map between the um, between this service that belongs to the tribe and to the other service that this service is dependent on and also the hosts and any other health checks that they want right so now as you can see on the screen here this one gives you a good view on what's the status of your overall workload right and then there are different views to this again when i say if i have to switch to the navigator view this one gives me a tabular view um and then the navigator view gives me um you know a little beautified view of this i can i can just click on include data this one is going to give me the highlights of the golden signals that says a hey, bubble wrap surveys response time is on an average the last 30 minutes is like this the last three hours is like this and the throughput is so much on an average and this is the error rate right and if you want to just show only the alerting entities and if you want to keep your screen clean you can do this as well it's going to show only the entities that are that are um, not behaving well and yeah so that 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 is how you create a workload you create a view for the entities that you are you're related to or, or, or the ones that you want to. Can you go to the uh, activity, uh, the um, activity tab there? Yeah, I really like that one as well. And this is kind yep. of nice because you can see here that, um, I don't know if you guys were paying attention, when, when Ganesh created this workload, he didn't create any charts at all. All he did was said, 
I want to add these apps, add these hosts, add this synthetic monitor, add this front end, uh, that's it. And what the system's done is it's gone, well, okay, I understand that this is an, this is an application uh, level entity. So I will show you application level uh, charts, which is you can see response time throughput error rate. If you scroll down, you're going to see infrastructure related uh, charts because he selected some hosts. So, so here are the charts uh, related to the three hosts that were selected. Going further down, we've got these awesome metrics that are specifically devoted to front end analysis. Right? I mean, why do you want to see largest contentful paint or first input delay when you're looking at the app, right? That's a very, very front end centric uh, measurement. And it doesn't make sense if you would apply that measurement to the app or the infra, but it makes no sense to apply other stuff to the front end. So you're looking at exactly the right values for the entities that are presented in this workload. So. Um, I, I really love that. I specifically love that, you know, it selects them for you. It knows which ones are the best uh, and every workload will be different uh, simply based on the entities that you choose to put in there. It'll pick the relevant charts for that entity type, All right? Uh, so that's quite a nice one. And then if you look at the tab just after that, that's the owner. So if you're, for example, you know, new in the team and yeah, look, you can flick through and you can look at the different tribes and what their workloads are and you can see who you need to go to for what help. Uh, again, it's, you know, we're just trying to make life easier, you know, fastest, <laughs> sometimes fastest mean time to recovery is just knowing who to call, <laughs> right? Who's the owner on this thing, right? Uh, we know what the problem is. We know how to solve it. We don't know who's got the log into it. You know, <laughs> at least right here, you've got owner information. We've got the actual live stats on the entire workload, all the apps uh, and all the infrastructure and all the front end telemetry all in one. And um, even before that, you would go right back to the beginning to the health and you'd probably leave your workload on that health view. And when you start seeing things that maybe go yellow or go red, you then drill into your activity and you can then see exactly what's going on. Um, now, um, we're, uh, we're coming towards the end. There's just a couple of other things I'd love to point out. So we've got some workloads here. How about we have a quick look at errors inbox, which you can only uh, you can only apply if you have a workload. So sure. yes, we, we capture errors, right guys? Obviously we capture errors. We capture front end errors. Uh, we capture application errors. We, you know, we capture errors all across the stack. Um, but if you want to be able to correlate errors from different entities as being related, well then you make those entities into a workload and we're able to then show all of the uh, all of the errors in one place that are related to one workload. So if we're talking about one tribe, for example, uh, you can see here, uh, Ganesh has gone from that top menu. Again, that, 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 the, the little drop down box on the right, it's like hidden magic there, right? Like all, all the things are there, <laughs> right? Uh, our main <laughs> ones are along the top, but then everything else goes into this one little, uh, drop down menu. So yeah, errors inbox is right there. And uh, when you click on that, you select a workload. So he selected the Demotron Telco workload. And we're filtering at the moment to errors that are in the unresolved state. Okay, so yeah, this is designed for you to use as a, as a triage tool and for you to actually start working through and resolving some of these issues that you're having. Uh, you can see all the way over on the right, you get the ability to assign uh, a specific error. So you can see there, you've got the little, yeah, you can click on those and see you can assign them to different people and then you can change the status of it to, you know, resolved or un unresolved as they currently are. And um, you can see there's that graph showing the occurrences over time, how many occurrences there've been. And obviously you're then able to click on any of these and drill down for further information related to the specific error.
Yeah, so there's yep. a there's one example. This is beautiful. Yeah, this 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 one is one example for something that's going on with uh, with one of the front end. Uh, the the web portal is a is a browser application which was added to the Demotron Telco V2 workload. And once we got this error, it it just captured this error and then so 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 basically the intention of errors in box is is you know it's it's going to make life easier for um, for all the developers, right? Because uh, as 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 a developer, there is there is definitely a, you know a lot of pain in detecting and triaging and getting the root cause of the error, even if it is occurring for the second time. It's always it's always really tough, right? So so at, at, from Neuralix side, what we have done is we just made sure that this is this is going to be a very developer friendly stuff here, right? And we don't want the developers to spend a lot of time identifying and losing context of everything, switching between different uh, different pages. So. What this one, what Errors Inbox does is just like how Dan mentioned, it's going to intelligently group all the uh, different types of, um, um, the same type, group different types of errors and then show them in one detailed summary of one page. And the best part here is that you can, as while you assign it to a person, the person can actually do the RCA, do the fix and add that in the, in the comments here, right? Just like this, right? Someone tag to you and then say, hey, please fix it, buddy. And someone says, hey, it's broken again. Can you please fix it? And hey, please take a look at this one. And the RCA comments can actually be mentioned under this. That one will help anyone uh, in future, if the same error occurs, what to do and what not to do. Right? Um, yeah, and, and, and this consolidation can happen across APM, browser, mobile, serverless, anything that you add to your uh, your workload. So yeah, like you can see here, um, this is this is basically the kind of um, you know um, an incident management solution that you have. It it groups up all the uh, different types of errors, lets you assign it to someone else, add comments, um, shows the complete set of activity, and use this as a reference for future as well. I would sort of say it's almost pre-incident uh, management. It's kind of like yep. you you you're solving these errors proactively in your workloads, so that incidents don't get generated in the first place. That is correct. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it is a pre-incident management, I guess. Uh, now, uh. Oh, here's a yeah. Here's an interesting question, um, and uh, it sort of it sort of relates to our I guess our last topic that I was going to mention, which was uh, I was just going to talk briefly about the full stack, like the different layers and just the, the general process on how to go about instrumenting, because we've been talking about that. But one of the questions here was, uh, can New Relic read, uh, you know, an APM, you know, in, read an application? Uh, behind uh, reverse proxy, right? Um, now uh, there is, yeah. So you're and and you you you've okay. So the, the other half of the question is is a statement saying you installed the agent, have installed agent in the past, but was unable to see uh, to see any data, uh, and most likely because it's being blocked. So. One of the things I usually do at this point, but you're sharing the screen, Ganesh, I'll get you to do it. <laughs> in Google, just do, you just say new relic networks, one, like networks, one word. And it takes you to a docs page. It's a really, really good docs page uh, that tells you the connectivity requirements for new relic, right? And I find it a lot easier to remember new relic networks <laughs> than I do uh, all the ins and out, in and out details. But this is the official page. As you can see, it was updated only just two months ago. It tells you all the domains uh, that you have to have access to, uh, and it gives you the, um, the actual network addresses as well that you would have to provide access into. Um, so uh, in terms of does, uh, do the agents work behind uh, behind proxy, can they function without internet access? Yes, they can. Uh, but you need some way, like you need it to send the data somewhere, and that thing would need to have some kind of access uh, uh, out to uh, out to New Relic to get the data there. So the app itself does not necessarily need internet connectivity. Uh, but yeah, if there's a proxy where we're able to route uh, via, 
and send the telemetry. Definitely possible. Uh, this would be your best place to start uh, in terms of trying to diagnose connectivity issues and working out what it is. Like you can see here, um, also very good point here uh, for us, you notice it says US region accounts and uh, EU region accounts. As we all know, there are only two regions in the world. Um, and uh, we are in the US. Did you know that? Yes, we are. <laughs> so um, uh, so the, the, we have um, <clears throat> the way New Relic structured uh, at the moment is uh, we have two major data centers uh, where all of our telemetry data goes. Okay, and one of them is in the US. It's in Chicago, and the other one is in Frankfurt. So uh, for all of our customers in EU, their data goes there. For everybody else, uh, which includes us. All right, uh, in the whole APJ region, um, we are all part of the US, actually. <laughs> um, so that's uh, that's where our data, uh, that's where our telemetry data goes, right? Um, <clears throat> quick point on that as well. Sometimes I get the question. I'll just throw the answer out before I get the question, right? Um, uh, at New Relic, we don't collect PII, right? So we don't collect personally identifiable information, right? Um, so we collect telemetry information. It's a different thing, right? Telemetry info, again, think of it like you're driving a car, right? What do we collect? We collect the, the, we collect the temperature of the brake pads. We collect the speed that you're going at. We collect the temperature of the oil. Uh, you know, we collect how much tread you've got on the tires. What we don't collect is who's driving the car and where they're going, right? We don't want to know this specific destination and we don't know who's driving the car. We don't even care. Like it's nothing personally identifiable, but we want to know all the telemetry about the vehicle. All right. Um, it's not to say you can't send that data in because again, you're like super flexible and you can actually uh, uh, collect custom attributes. So you could get your app to send any information you want. Right. Um, into New Relic, but that's then up to you to decide what, you know, what um, custom attributes you want to add in. <clears throat> so yeah, um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Gives you the networks page, which is a good one. I, I sometimes forget to give you guys that, but I, <laughs> like, for, I like for you to have it. Uh, it's a very good page. <clears throat> um, uh, a couple other questions, again, related to uh, service maps. Um, if you maybe want to just show where to get those again. Uh, so if you go from uh, from a application entity, guys, or from a from a browser entity, for example, uh, will be probably the easiest ways. But you can jump in. Uh, now that's okay. That's service levels, right? So there, there was two questions, one yep. service level, one service level. So you don't see service level, you don't see it because it's beta, right? It's not actually GA yet. So we're gonna pretend that doesn't exist, all right? <laughs> um, because it doesn't exist, all right? But yeah. eventually the idea behind it, right? I mean, I can tell you what the concept is behind it, yeah? The idea is, so you guys are going to do your fundamentals training. After this, you're going to come back and you're going to learn about service level management. You're going to learn about alert quality management. You're going to then have these awesome service levels which you want to apply to your workloads. So you will put in some relevant service level objectives uh, and you will have some nice service level indicators to tell you if you're meeting your objectives and you'll be able to track those right alongside your workload. That's the concept, but it doesn't exist, right? Put it out of mind. It's beta, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, you can subscribe to the beta program, right? There, uh, uh, you can do that if you really want and get all the experimental features and play around. Okay, this is a GA class, though, right? I'm not talking about beta. <laughs> um, uh, quick answer. Is there a Terraform, yes. Sorry, is is there, there a terraform? Is there a terraform support? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Go the ahead. quick answer to that is yes, definitely. Right. Um, you can go onto Terraform's page actually, look up, uh, go to the Terraform providers and there's a ton of info there uh, with regard to New Relic support. Um, in fact, I will go as far as to say, I don't want to go into this stuff uh, right now, but I would say uh, definitely that is a good way to go. You want to automatically instrument wherever you can. So if you're doing auto deploys, you want auto instrumentation to be included in that auto deploy, 
right? So you can roll out and then, you know, an entire new network, uh, have it be, you know, the apps are ready to go, they're already instrumented, the alerts are automatically put in place, the dashboards are there. Every, all of that can be done programmatically. So, uh, and we would highly recommend that you do so. We would go as far as to say uh, that's pretty much the best practice. So, yes. Good, do it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, integration, uh, Jira, uh, where, where, where are we at with Jira? We had Jira for a bit. We lost Jira. We've got Jira back. Where are we at with Jira at the moment? Ganesh? We do not, uh, there is, there is, the, uh, I, I think we, because of the last year Jira API changes, uh, that went yeah. to, I think back a couple of years ago, uh -huh. um, we just disable it. We just disable it from then. Um, and we are trying to get back that button that says, you know, create a Jira ticket. Uh, but yeah. then that's, that, that is still in progress. That is still in progress. Product team is on it. Yeah, we had it and then we lost it and then we had it again and then, you know, yeah. we lost it again and, and we're, we're getting it back, you know, um, <laughs> uh, actually when you look at, um, if you go and look in, uh, applied intelligence, which we'll look at in another session, um, it, it shows it there. It's, you know, but it's like coming soon. So, uh, yes, uh, I will say yes. At some point. At some point, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, cool. We got the answer on that one. Any data transformation components available with an ingestion area if developer sends PCI, PII data to neural by mistake? You wanna I think we should talk talk about the data dropping rules. Yeah, you wanna take that one? Uh, yes, I was gonna say oh, yeah, so sure. go for it, Ganesh. Sure. Um, yeah, so in case of the developer side of PI or PCI data, um, so yeah, I think like Dan mentioned some time back, the very first thing is none of the agents or the components that Neuralink um, instruments your application with collect any PI data. We do not collect any PI data or any sensitive information. Um, but un if a developer sends it by mistake uh, and if it is identified and if you would like to drop the data, we also have, we have something called as um, data dropping rules because we have a GraphQL server uh, which exposes a set of APIs to the admins uh, who can leverage those APIs and then drop all the data by feeding, um, yeah, by, 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 by just feeding a query, an RQL query. If you can identify that data through an RQL query, you can just feed that to the GraphQL API and then uh, just drop all the data that you want. It is possible to drop it. How much of an hour right. can be set up as code uh, for backing up and recreating dashboards workloads? Oh, this is this is this is very nice. I love this question. Um, I think recently we uh, we also gave a session on uh, Terraform, uh, me and Steve, um, which was um, which was very well um, attended. And um, I'm gonna um, just 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 go to the Neuralink provider on Terraform registry, and then you can see we you you can literally create dashboards, alerts, um, you know, the new dashboard format that we have, synthetics, workloads, um, and a bunch of other stuff that that you can actually do on the UI. And like you, like you rightly mentioned, um, for backing up and recreating the dashboards and workloads, using Terraform would be the, would be the way, best way. Once all the data is instrumented, everything and all the curated views and, the, and everything that you're seeing, uh, configuration that you can do from UI, most of them then can be done through Terraform. I suggest you to go to the registry on Terraform and then take a look at all the resources that are available. All right. Uh, and a tracing question. Uh, can we trace uh, can we trace a transaction end to end if we've got a few extra services stuck in the middle? Uh, like MuleSoft or BizTalk or something in the middle. Um, I believe MuleSoft or BizTalk would be treated as an external services because those will not be um, instrumented as a backend service by Neuralic. Um, and if and if and if not instrumented, that would be treated as treated as an end to end uh, as an external service. Uh, but again, it depends on the use case. Um, we can please reach out to us separately and we can have a detailed discussion on this. Um, just on that as well, guys. So <clears throat> even though, so there's two things 
one is looking at the trace all the way through and looking inside each component. Um, and what Ganesh was saying is that we may not be able to look inside the component. It doesn't mean you won't see the trace and it doesn't mean we won't get any information. Uh, if you're looking right. inside an external service, you will still see uh, the the number of requests made to it. You will still see the amount of time that that service takes to respond to those requests, right? You just can't, because it's external to, uh, you know, it hasn't been instrumented, uh, you, will, you just won't be able to go right inside the actual service itself, see, you know, all the timings on every individual transaction and, and the methods inside those transactions. So you'll miss that. Um, but it's not to say that in that in that trace you'll get no info. Uh, you you will still get the amount of time spent in that component of the trace. Uh, e, okay. Yes. Uh, last one. Uh, yep. Uh, class is recorded. Uh, links. Uh, I'll have to. They they take a while to render and everything, but um, I'll probably provide you the link. Uh, in the next session because I don't actually have one now because it's our first session. So yes, uh, links will be provided for the recordings, definitely. Um, and I don't know anything about Pulumi. Uh, do we do have a we do have a provider on Pulumi as well. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I think it, it's not as extensive as Terraform. Uh, but we definitely have Pulumi provider also, um, and you can take a look at the um, yeah you can take a look at the registry, and that also has New Relic in it. Uh, it's not as extensive as Terraform, but yeah we have um, we we have few things covered there. All right, uh, guys, uh, let me. I'm, I'm going to throw up one slide. It'll be the last slide of the day. Uh, come back next week. Next week, we will talk about APM. We're going to talk about the agents. Uh, it's going to be quite heavily focused on APM next week and infrastructure, right? But we're, we've really gone across the whole platform. We've gone very broad today. We now want to start diving in to each of these specific solutions. So come back next week. Next week, we're looking at that all important middle layer of the stack. No, it's not the top layer. It is the middle layer. It's your application layer. And we also want to look a little bit at the infrastructure stuff as well. So uh, I'll leave you with one, uh, one last thing. to have a bit of a play around with if you want to. It's optional. Uh, I gave you guys the login credentials earlier. Okay, so um, just, it's it's not really a full lab, it's just more of a, an experience with a bit of a guide. Have a bit of a flick through some of the things that we've shown you today. So I just want you to go to home, go to the Explorer, try those different views, right? And ideally, do this with your account if you can, right? If you've got access in your account, do it in your account. If you don't, log in with the training account that I gave you uh, so that you can experience it, so you can understand what data is in there, okay? Uh, and uh, by all means, go through and create a workload in the NIU training account as well. So go and grab a bunch of entities and you know put them all in together to see what comes out when you, when you make a workload and then you can even go and play around a little bit with the Arab inbox as well. Uh, so I'll, yeah, I'll leave this slide here for you guys. And um, I'll, li I'll leave it up to you. It's, it's optional if you want to go through it. Um, All right, a um, couple of other questions now, pretty specific ones. Uh, but yeah, we'll, uh, okay guys, we'll, uh, we'll we'll finish up the session. So if you guys, uh, if you don't have any questions, uh, feel free to log out now. Thank you very much for your attendance today. It's been pretty fun. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. Uh, we are trying to make it entertaining. Uh, if you want us to wear some funny hats or something, make it more fun for you next week, let us know. Uh, but otherwise, uh, we are very much looking forward to seeing you all back here at the exact same time. It's 1 p.m. Uh, 1 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. Um, Ganesh very uh, kindly decided to join me at 8.30 in the morning. It was 8.30, right? 
for you? It is, it is, yeah, 8.30 in the morning. Yeah, so yeah, so Ganesh has got an 8.30 start every Monday morning uh, with me for the next six weeks. Very, very nice. I really appreciate it. That's awesome. Uh, we will answer the last couple of questions uh, for you guys now and then um, uh, finish up and look forward to seeing you guys next week. All right. Uh, let's, uh, let's get on to these last couple of questions. Uh, so... Uh, Monitor uh, Microsoft Dynamics CRM on premise. Uh, Microsoft Dynamics CRM. Um, not really sure what the what the tech platform that's used to, uh, under this, but if it is .NET, yes, um, you can instrument it with uh, with with um, New Relic APM .NET agent that that we already have, and that should give you enough data of all the web transactions that your services services um, dealing with. And if we are talking about the dynamic CRM, the front end as well, um, again, based on the technology, um, we should have a we should have a browser um, uh, monitoring that's available that you can instrument with your front end to look at front end performance. Yeah, I'll I'll answer that by saying that if you have code level access to the app, yeah, yeah, and the app is, and the app is written in either Ruby, Python. PHP or Node, .NET, Java, C or Go, and you have code level access to the app, then you can install the application level agent. And you should be able, and provided the application has some mechanism to get back to New Relic, <laughs> either directly or via proxy, then you can, uh, then you can have um, instrumentation on the app. I think I've made it sound more complex than it is. <laughs> in most cases, it's like two lines, right? It's just you just put these two lines in and bang, your app's instrumented. In most cases, it's that easy. Yeah. Um, but that's that's where we're going to start next week, right? So next week we'll start. Uh, remind me, Ganesh, if I don't do it in the beginning. But that's how sure. we want to start. We want to we want to jump in with the add more data button, right? We want to talk about the guided install. We want to talk about the application agents a little bit. Um, all right. I think that's, is that most of them? I think we've looked at most of the questions. Yeah, that, that, that's most of the questions. Um, sometimes they come in too about, fast and I miss them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> someone is asking if you can install your agent on your MacBook. Um, uh, give it a shot, uh, because it's Linux platform. Maybe you should be, you, you can do it, but I don't think, um, you will get all the stats because I tried it and then I have my infrastructure stats uh, available. Um, just give it a shot, give it a shot and let us know next time how how we, how, we, how, how things look. Uh, tracing the transaction request end to end and set up the metrics. Oh yeah, that it's the same question uh, that we had on the um, Microsoft integration layer, microservice integration layer here. Um, and is it possible for you to provide us the link to the Terraform session? Um, I believe it's shared with all the attendees, um, but let me double check. I'm gonna note this down and then share it in the next session uh, if I have it available. And then, oh, someone is asking if uh, they can get one of the cool data on t-shirts. <laughs> Yeah, if you guys uh, if you guys attend all the sessions in the training, I will see what I can do for marketing. I'm gonna have to convince them, right? So we need to have a compelling case. So if you guys attend every session, I'll be telling them, come on, you know, they 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 came to the whole training, right? They were participating the whole time. They deserve something nice. Like, come on, let's be nice. And and I'm sure at that point they'll say, oh yeah, they're so nice. It's all good. Let's do it. <laughs> but I'll do my best to organize something. All right, rest of rest all of them are like kind of um, yeah, that's all. Those are all the questions we had, Dan. Yeah, the uh, the only other thing I saw, I didn't see if you had an answer for it, was uh, talking a little bit later about uh, taking a transaction from front end all the way through to back end um, and going through that process. Uh, so yeah, we will. That'll be when we talk about distributed tracing. We will be doing that. That actually will be next week. Okay, so that's a, a nice topic for us to talk about at that time. 
But um, as I said, I wasn't going to keep you guys past that three hour mark. We've just hit the three hour mark. So I'm going to let you go. Thank you very much once again for your attendance uh, and uh, really looking forward to seeing you all back here uh, next week for our second half of the first day of our New Relic Fundamental Platform Training. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Ganesh.